I remember that morning my dog Rusty would not stop barking. Seems like a fair omen considering what happened in the woods later that day. I should mention, my name is Milo Fletcher and I'm a professional hunter. I live in the outskirts of Prescott, Arizona, a small town surrounded by dense forests. Noticing a strong cup of coffee wouldn't calm Rusty down, I decided to take him hunting with me. We drove out to the Ivapai Forest, a favorite spot of mine for both hunting and escaping the stress of everyday life. Slowing increasing our pace, we started our trek through the dense woods. I once mentioned to a friend how tough this life can be, paying child support for two kids who barely know me and living alone most days. He said it sounded terrible, but I learned to make peace with it. As Rusty led the way, I noticed something amiss. A gruesome scene greeted us I found a man's torn clothes with blood stains all over them. Nearby lay his phone, shattered into pieces. Now Rusty's panicked barking made sense. Someone needed help. Before deciding on our next steps, Rusty went silent as he fixated on something further in foliage. Heart pounding and hands trembling, I cautiously followed him into the dense undergrowth. We came upon a clearing where the mutilated body of the missing man lay. It was indescribable the worst sight I'd encountered throughout my hunting career. Logic dictated there must be a rarely seen creature prowling nearby. Steadying my breaths, I tightly gripped my rifle as we ventured deeper into the forest. My senses heightened. Every leaf rustle or branch snap increased my unease ever careful not to alert our unknown adversary. At one point... Rusty dashed ahead before stopping abruptly in front of me and stared past me with terror-stricken eyes. A bone-chilling growl reverberated through the trees, and I finally glimpsed the source of our fear. A creature with leathery skin, glowing red eyes, and intimidatingly sharp teeth stood before us. Its appearance was unlike any earthly animal I'd hunted in the past. The menacing figure towered over me, emitting another guttural growl that seemed to echo throughout the forest. Instinctively, my hand reached for my phone to call for help, but I remembered the ill-fated hiker's phone earlier. If someone was tracking him, they must have injured or killed them as well. We were on our own against this formidable foe. Retreating slowly, Rusty cautiously followed me as we hatched a plan to survive. We desperately needed fresh game and quickly moved towards the only plentiful water source nearby the Winfrey Creek. However, our uninvited guest on our tail only intensified my terror. Bizarrely, or maybe just luck pushed us into another hunter near the creek. He introduced himself as Emmett Harrington. As we exchanged stories, I came to know that his wife Wilma had gone missing nearby just last week a possibility we couldn't ignore as unrelated. Meanwhile, Rusty continued his uneasy growling and barking at an alarming rate. Sensing something was near, we both lifted our rifles in anticipation when the beast lunged from its hidden spot in a bush off to the side. Staggering back in horror as it charged towards us at full speed, I managed to brace my rifle against my shoulder and take aim at the beast with only seconds left to make a potentially life-saving shot. Desperate, I took a deep breath and squeezed the trigger, my heart pounding in my chest. The bullet struck the creature in its shoulder, causing it to roar in pain and rage. It swiveled its massive frame towards me, then charged even more fiercely. Run! Emmett yelled as he fired off shots as well. We glanced at each other before bolting in opposite directions, hoping to split up the beast's attention. As I sprinted through the woods, I realized how futile it was for us to call for help there was no chance anyone could come quickly enough, and with the murdered hiker's phone destroyed, we had no means of communication. Gasping for breath, I slid behind a large tree to catch my breath. Moments later, 
What sounded like an explosion erupted through the woods as Emmett screamed in agony. I knew I couldn't leave him to be mauled by the creature alone but felt paralyzed by fear. Please, help! Emmett's plea snapped me back to the horrifying reality we were facing. Clenching my teeth and gripping my rifle tightly, I ran back toward the sound of his cries. When I reached the scene, a chilling sight greeted me. My fellow hunter lay on the ground with his leg twisted unnaturally, and the beast stood over him. As it raised one massive claw to finish off Emmett, Rusty lunged forward with a fierce snarl and latched onto its hind leg. The distraction gave me enough time to aim my weapon again and fire at its exposed back. It screeched in pain once more before barreling towards me. My heart raced as it came within inches of me when it suddenly halted brought down by another gunshot from Emmett's rifle. Despite his severe injury, he managed to support himself just long enough to take one final shot. The creature didn't move. It simply lay there, breathing heavily, blood oozing from its wounds. We stared at the unmoving beast, trying to process what had just transpired. We still had no idea what it was or why it attacked us. But with our lives on the line, finding answers wasn't a priority. We needed to get Emmett medical attention and quickly. With Emmett propped up on my shoulder, we made the painfully slow trek back to the Winfrey Creek, hoping to find someone, anyone, who could help us. Rusty cautiously mirrored our movements, ears perked and eyes scanning our surroundings. As we approached the creek, we spotted a group of campers further along. They rushed to help when they saw Emmett's condition, and after explaining what had happened, leaving out the specifics of our monstrous attacker, one of them called for emergency services. Two days later, I sat in the local hospital waiting area alongside Rusty as Emmett underwent surgery for his mangled leg. Authorities had blamed the attack on an unknown wild animal and were searching the area for it but nobody knew it had left on its own after our encounter. A nurse called my name and gestured me to follow her into a room where Emmett was resting after a successful operation that saved his leg. He gave me a weary smile as we chatted about the events that took place in those woods. Though many questions remained unanswered about the creature's origin and intent, one thing became painfully clear. What we'd faced was something far more dangerous than we could ever have imagined in our wildest nightmares. In time, the terror gradually subsided but never entirely disappeared. Life slowly returned to normalcy for both of us, but I could never truly forget those harrowing moments or shake off an unnerving feeling of watchfulness that now haunted me whether I was hunting or simply sitting at home. As I reminisced about the series of events that led to our gruesome encounter— I couldn't help but pay tribute to those who tragically lost their lives to the beast's wrath, the ill-fated hiker and Emmett's wife, Wilma. And every time I locked eyes with Rusty, a silent understanding passed between us. We had both peered into the abyss of a dark unknown and emerged forever changed. I've never been much of a betting man, but if you'd asked me to wager on where I'd find myself on any given workday, buried deep in the hills of rural Montana at the clandestine Harlow Genetic Research Facility would have had astronomically high odds. My name is Casper Gresham, a low-profile government employee in the kind of job that never gets a mention at high school career days. That's because even I wasn't quite sure what I was facilitating with each keystroke and sample analysis. It was the intersection of genetics, national security, and stuff so above my pay grade that asking too many questions could land you in an undisclosed location indefinitely. The day at Harlow began without incident if you exclude Dr. Talia Rook's coffee pot shattering on the gleaming tile floor spewing hot liquid like an erupted geyser. 
She muttered choice words under her breath, ones that would make a sailor blush, but her frustration drew a brief chuckle from us both. It was one of those unguarded moments where we forgot about the suffocating secrecy surrounding us. You'd think with all this high-tech gear they can afford us a decent coffee maker. Talia grumbled. What, and risk us being too awake to blindly follow orders? I quipped. The camaraderie was cut short as Maynard Kipps, our hard-edged supervisor with a head perpetually glistening from lack of hair rather than brilliance, stepped into view. Less banter, more work, he barked. That morning unfolded with monotony until I received a sample unlike any other. The data set was anomalous, sequences twisting and patterns non-conforming to anything terrestrial. I reported it up the chain with a notion of concern tickling my thoughts. Something new had landed on my workstation. Lunchtime brought no relief as Maynard insisted I skip breaks until further notice. The sun had started its slow descent by the time Dr. Rook approached me with news. Casper, she whispered urgently, something's gone horribly wrong in Sector 7. You need to see this. Sector 7 was strictly off-limits for someone like me. Genetic material there came with classifications so confidential that even their code names were classified. We stole down austere corridors bathed in sterile white light until we arrived at the observation window for Sector 7. What lay beyond sent chills through me. Lab assistants lay scattered across the floor, motionless as though rag dolls discarded by a capricious child. Metal clanked from within, rapid and heavy thuds against solid steel doors which barely contained whatever horror awaited inside. Talia's eyes reflected a terror she fought hard to mask. In moments like this you wish your job's hazards only included paper cuts and spilt coffee. Casper, he hissed through gritted teeth. We have to help them. We were interrupted by Maynard who swiftly interjected himself between us and the window portal to pandemonium. No one enters or leaves. He commanded authoritatively yet his veins pulsed visibly on his temple betraying his sanctioned bravado. Dr. Rook was uncharacteristically submissive to his edict. She knew better than anyone that defying protocol could have unseen consequences graver than what lay before us. Night fell over Harlow like an oppressive blanket as emergency protocols sprung into action sealing every door, every vent in an attempt to contain what couldn't be defined, confined, or understood except by its actions which spoke universally of deadly intent and unfathomable malice. Preparing for mandatory lockdown I opted for one last survey outside our bolted stronghold. Checking perimeter cameras when an aberration caught my gaze an insidious shadow flitting amidst the trees distorting moonlight into grotesque caricatures menacing and mesmerizing all at once. In milliseconds decisions had to be made. Report back with findings or investigate what could be paramount data or certain death. Equipped with only flimsy confidence and regulation sidearm, I chose fieldwork over paperwork, giving chase into thickest darkness towards frightened whispers lest we aren't alone in these woods. I turned from the perimeter cameras, heart pounding, knowing that I should alert the others. Protocol demanded it. Instead, I found myself reaching for the emergency alarm to initiate an evacuation bypassing direct confrontation with whatever lurked outside. Evacuation? Dr. Rook questioned as the siren wailed, her eyes wide with fear and confusion. There's something out there, I replied, pointing to the monitors where shadows still dance beyond our walls. We gathered everyone we could find and directed them toward the basement tunnels that would lead us to a neighboring facility. It was a route meant for dire emergencies only, barely traversed and poorly lit, but our situation left no room for hesitation. As we moved quickly, a horrible sound echoed through the corridors behind us. Metal twisted and concrete cracked. 
It became clear that the creature was forcing its way inside, undeterred by our attempts at security. Its presence was immense. Panic set in around us as we heard it move through Harlow with devastating force. Screams echoed, some cut abruptly as though silenced by violent means. We didn't see it clearly, not at first. But there were glimpses, patches of fur or skin amid twisted metal, limbs too long to be human stretching around corners reaching for those slower than the rest. We lost people in the chaos. Martin from security was caught looking back when a grotesque hand took hold of him. There was nothing we could do but keep moving and not let their sacrifices go in vain. Hours felt stretched into days until we emerged gasping for air on safe ground where we were met by armed responders who had made their way to us following the trail of devastation. Only when we recounted what little we saw did they bring up species of bear that might explain it, a beast driven mad by disease or territorial instinct perhaps stirred by our encroachment into its habitat. They speculated while we listened silently knowing full well no natural creature could wreak such havoc. In the end, they found what was left of Harlow, a hollow shell scraped clean of life, and Martin's wallet among other personal effects which told stories of those no longer able to do so themselves. The tale of that horrendous night spread among survivors and rescue teams alike a vague narrative of survival against ferocity incarnate. And as I shared my account with those willing to listen, I remembered Martin's face just before his untimely end and wondered if somewhere in the darkened woods another unwary soul might face something similar, an apex predator beyond understanding. Thus ended our ordeal with creatures best left undisturbed in their wild domains and protocols rewritten to better safeguard against horrors that lurk at civilization's fringes where nature reclaims its due with tooth and claw. This happened to me a couple of years back never quite been the same since. My name's Dorian, and I'm an avid outdoorsman by hobby. Work in retail management. You should see the crap I deal with there. Anyway, my only escape is nature. That's why I got hooked on RV life. Nothing like hitting the open road with my home in tow. Last summer, after a particularly nasty week at work, I decided to head west. I'd heard Yosemite National Park was spectacular, all those giant cliffs and waterfalls. I figured it was the perfect reset I needed. I rented a decent-sized RV with all the essentials. The drive out to California was long, but it put me in the right mindset. You get that sense of anticipation, a shedding of the mundane stuff from real life. It's exhilarating in its own way. I rolled into Yosemite just before sunset, found a campground at the far end of the park. Smaller, less known, right up my alley since I wasn't one for crowds. As soon as I stepped out of the RV, I knew I'd hit gold. I could smell the pine and hear the faint rush of a river in the distance. That night, with the sky full of stars, I felt more alive than I had in ages. Next morning, I woke up fully relaxed, made breakfast, and laced up my hiking boots. This is where things took a weird turn. While on a trail deeper in the woods, I came across a ramshackle cabin. Seemed abandoned and rundown, something nobody'd used in years. Curiosity got the better of me you watch too many wilderness documentaries. You start picturing grizzled mountain men and lost history. There was this weird symbol carved into the door of the cabin, not something I recognized. Didn't give it much thought, figuring it was hiker graffiti or maybe an old hobo sign. Took some pictures, figured I'd do some research on it later for fun. The rest of the day I enjoyed, took another long hike, cooked dinner overlooking one of the valleys, typical tourist trip. 
but I couldn't shake the image of that cabin. It had felt unnerving somehow. When it got dark, I settled in, planning to get an early start the next day. That's when it started. At first, I thought it was wind whipping through the trees, making a whistling sound. But it kept getting louder, more persistent, and it wouldn't stop. I sat bolt upright in the RV's tiny bed, trying to figure out what it was. Then it finally struck me. It wasn't the wind, it was someone out there, calling in a high-pitched, eerie way. Like half-bird, half-human, the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. This continued throughout the night, and I got zero sleep. As the sky slowly began to lighten, the chilling calls finally faded away. At that point, I was on full-blown freakout mode. Packed up everything in record time, then hauled out of the campground like a maniac. Didn't look back once. Back on the highway, it took a minute to get my wits back. What the hell was that thing in the woods? A prankster messing with folks? Some crazy person living in the wilds? It didn't really compute. It just felt wrong. Too animalistic, too strange. My rational brain fought against what I'd heard, but I knew what I'd experienced. There was something unsettling about that place, something deep within those silent forests. Even while checking into a random motel on the drive home, I kept my phone close, ready to dial 911 at the first hint of trouble. I spent a sleepless night there too, constantly jolting awake in a cold sweat. Later that day, back in civilization, I finally got internet signal. Tried researching the symbol I'd seen on the cabin door. It wasn't a common one, nothing in my immediate search results. I ventured onto some more obscure sites, dedicated to folklore and local legends. Nothing much came up. It just seemed like that weird cabin symbol was, well, it was lost in history. In the years since, I've gone camping again, but never alone. And I stick to popular parks, avoiding any remote spots. No reason to tempt fate, right? And the sound of that whistling call. Well, that'll haunt me forever. Sometimes, if the wind howls just right, I swear I hear an echo of it. My blood runs ice cold every damn time. It's a sharp reminder. There are things out there the internet doesn't explain. Things beyond maps and trails and curated experiences. There's a hidden side to the wild. Something ancient and indifferent. Watching us from places we're not meant to tread. I experienced it firsthand. And that knowledge forever changed me. A good ten years ago, maybe more, I got myself into a mess the likes of which you wouldn't believe. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm no stranger to the outdoors. Dad raised me up hunting every season, camping in the thick of things, fishing for our dinner at least a couple of times a month. My name is Elkanah, by the way. Funny name, I know. Anyhow, my buddy Silas and I, well... He's got this cousin with a bit of land tucked away in the Ozark Mountains. Word was the deer hunting out there was fantastic, and a weekend away from the wives sounded about perfect after a summer of overtime shifts. It's an all-day drive, that place, a real haul, and then an old dirt road for the last few miles. But nothing an experienced guy like me can handle. That first night, we were both bone-tired. But you know how that first night of any expedition always is. Restless sleep. Every squeak of wind sounds like a bear at the door. I woke with the first hint of sunlight peeking through the flap of the tent, grabbed my coffee and a stale leftover granola bar. Gotta love those, huh? And decided to do a short hike, scout out the trails a bit. I'd gone probably two miles when something snagged my eye. Wasn't moving, 
just an odd shape up ahead where the light hit the bark of an old pine. Got my blood going, that little flash of is that something alive? Turned out to be, well, the weirdest damn thing I'd seen in my years trekking in the wilderness. Looked like some poor animal had gotten torn up, for everywhere, what I guess would be its innards strewn like some morbid Christmas wreath around the tree trunk. No blood, though, not a drop. Dried out, kinda dusty even. Then it hit me, no stink. You ever been anywhere near roadkill? Even a squirrel gets you gagging if the wind's wrong. And there was not a hint of rotten scent here. Right then, a prickle started at the base of my neck. You get that feeling, sometimes, like there's eyes on you. I spun around, scanning the undergrowth. Nobody there. Not that anyone could have hidden easily with the dense brush anyway. It's weird, but that creeped me out more than the dead thing, whatever it was. That thing felt wrong, not like anything natural had done that. But now I felt plain stupid, a grown-ass man spooked in broad daylight. Come on, Elkanah, you gonna back down this early? No chance. So I kept walking. Now, I wish I could say that was the end of it. But that wasn't my lucky day. About an hour later, I caught a flash of movement ahead on the trail. Something big, moving fast and not even trying to be quiet. And then I heard it a grunt, loud, but kinda breathy too. A deer wouldn't do that. And definitely not a damn squirrel. The thought of that messed up carcass came roaring back in this time. The hair on my arms didn't even pretend to lie down. Something wasn't right here. Something big wasn't right. It could have been just another hunter. Though what kind of idiot is crashing through the bushes full tilt? My hand went to my belt, found the grip of my revolver. Don't go into the backwoods without a piece, that's what my dad always said. Now, here's the thing, I'm not the confrontational type. Avoid that mess if I can. So I did what felt smart at the time, stepped off the trail into the trees, and waited. Figured whatever it was would pass by, and I'd just cut across the woods parallel and beat it back to camp. That went to hell real fast. That goddamn grunt again, way closer. Maybe thirty feet away, behind a cluster of thick pines. The trees themselves started shaking, and out of the dim green light steps the biggest, the biggest damn thing I've ever laid eyes upon. No fur. Well, mostly. Patches of coarse, dark hair clung to its shoulders and hips like it was an old man with a ripped-up bathrobe. Massive hands looked half again bigger than mine, ended in claws at least three inches long. But its size wasn't even the worst. The face, damn near human, twisted up in a way that sent a shockwave of pure wrongness through me. Eyes like dirty coins, with this flat look that wasn't curious, wasn't angry. Just dead. And the smell. God, like raw meat left out in the worst heat of August. Every instinct I had, honed by years of hunting, was screaming at me to run. Not fast enough, not smart enough, just run like hell. I didn't. For a few heartbeats, all I could do was stare at that nightmare that shouldn't have ever existed. I guess it might have thought the same, just stood there watching. Or maybe waiting. Silence hung so heavy, I swore I could hear my blood pulse in my ears. I was ready to bolt, legs coiled tight and my fingers starting to cramp around the gun. That thing took a step towards me. That's when the screaming started. Not its screaming, but me. Like a little goddamn kid. All that control I was so proud of? Gone, vanished like smoke. Legs were moving before I even decided to, scrambling backward, stumbling over roots and rocks. It didn't charge, didn't even seem like it was hurrying. Just walking, calm as you please, straight towards me. 
That's all it took. I lost what little was left of my damn mind. Legs moved on their own, stumbling backward, scrambling over roots and rocks as that inhuman scream clawed its way out of my throat again and again. Branches whipped my face, ripped at my arms. Each crash and crackle in the underbrush sounded like another footfall coming for me. The revolver, hell, I don't even know if I dropped it or still had it. All I know is, there was only one thing louder in my head than that godforsaken scream, run, run, run. There was a gap up ahead, barely visible between the trunks, sunlight promising an opening. If I could just reach it, maybe circle back to another trail. Some stupid fragment of my brain tried to strategize between breaths that rasped in my lungs like broken glass. Tripped. Went down hard, hands scrabbling on the moss-covered ground. But the thing that twisted up my insides with terror was the silence. No grunts, no footfalls. The screaming died in my throat. That empty silence was worse than any monster noise. Slowly, oh so slowly, I raised my head and looked back. It was there, maybe ten feet away. That dead-eyed gaze fixed on me, like I was some strange bug beneath its notice. My legs refused to obey. Panic squeezed tight as a fist around my insides. Then it reached out with one of those monstrous clawed hands and did the most terrifying thing of all. It pointed. I followed the line of that crooked finger, and a flash of white caught my eye. My backpack. Not dropped like I'd lost it in a blind flight. Settled neatly under a tree, almost like it had been, placed there. My granola bar was right on top, the wrapper torn just so, and it was empty. Not even crumbs left. Something in me cracked then. All the adrenaline bled away in an instant, leaving me limp as a dead fish. Not an animal, then. Not just some predator gone bad. This thing could think. And it wanted me to know it. A growl rumbled low from its chest then, an echoing, ground-shaking threat. Then another of those grunts, and behind it, an answering call. That's when the real fight-or-flight kicked in. Not the terrified animal thing, but the cold, desperate logic that sometimes comes when you know you're in one hell of a damn mess. They outnumbered me. And if something that big could move quietly enough to sneak up on a seasoned outdoorsman. Well, no good pretending I could outrun them. Gun would be useless, unless I got lucky enough for a brain shot, and with my hands shaking like leaves— Luck had taken a one-way bus out of town. So what was left? Play dead? Hope to God whatever weird game this was satisfied them? Didn't sit right. This whole setup, it was almost like showing off. Like a cat with a mouse under its paw. No, if I wasn't getting eaten, if I was being observed, there might be a sliver of a chance. With a final defiant glare at the hulking figure, they don't scare animals by looking dead or weak, Dad would say, gotta face it down. I turned and walked away. One shaky step after another, as calm as I could manage. Just making for the gap in the trees, that patch of sunlight that mocked me as I kept expecting to feel claws sink into my shoulders. Then there were pines flashing by too fast feet barely finding purchase, fueled by pure terror. No plan, just move, move until daylight ran out or, hopefully, I stumbled onto another trail or back to one of Silas's damn deer stands. It felt like hours, or maybe only minutes, a time-blurred fog of branches and undergrowth and hammering heartbeat. Suddenly, I burst out of the trees onto a gravel road. My truck— Glory be, I made it back to my truck. I don't think I stopped yelling until I hit the interstate, windows up and hands clenched white on the steering wheel. Never saw them again, thank whatever's higher than heaven. 
Never found any trace either. Silas thought I'd finally lost my damn mind, and honestly, some days I'm not sure I blame him. I did file a report. Missing hiker, weird animal carcass. Yeah, I added that after my hands stopped shaking enough to write. I knew nobody would believe a word. They didn't. Nobody does. That cousin of Silas? Turns out the property got put up for sale real quiet like a couple of months after, with nary a mention of some rich folks snapping it up like there was a gold rush waiting down that dirt road. These days, I keep a closer eye on the tree line even when I'm just hunting the backyard with my nephew's toy bow and arrow set. And sure, folks laugh and shake their heads. You can't explain certain things. That wrongness in the deep woods. That kind of monstrousness lurking just out of sight. Maybe it was Bigfoot. Maybe something we ain't even got a name for yet. All I know is, whatever it was, it ain't natural. And some things, man, those are way bigger than a six-point buck. Some things, they change you, make you appreciate just how thin the line is between the world we know and the wild places that just tolerate our little bit of light. A few years back, I made a total impulse decision when my backpacking buddy bailed at the last minute. Not my smartest move, in hindsight. Always been into camping, exploring, that feeling of getting away from everything, even if it's just for a few days. Anyway, this time I set my sights on Death Valley National Park. Yeah, not a great pick in mid-July, but figured I'd handle the heat go further west where it drops at night. My name's Rowan, by the way. Work and IT desk life gets to you after a while. Made it down late Thursday. Got myself the basic campsite permit. Place looks massive, almost unsettling with how open it is. Sunbaked salt flats stretching to the horizon, not a tree in sight. Figured I'd stick to some of the higher elevation trails ones further back. Packed up Friday morning, hit the road in my rented SUV before full sunrise. Trailhead I'd picked was at the very end of a long dirt track, bumpy as hell. Didn't see another soul out there that morning. It felt wrong almost, too hot, too quiet. Didn't see much wildlife either, just some lizards. Took off up the trail, rocky and winding through dry washes. A good few hours gone by noon, I'd probably gone further than I should have. Figured I'd stop to eat on the exposed section of the ridge just up ahead. That's when I see the movement. It's low to the ground, on the other side of the gulch cutting across the trail. Pale-colored thing, maybe the size of a coyote. Too skinny to be a stray dog in this area. I figure I finally found some desert creature. Pull my binoculars out, take a closer look. The instant I focus those lenses, it stands up on two legs. Stands up like a person. No way it's an animal now. Skin hangs off it too loose, too much exposed bone. Let's out a screech, high and weird, makes the hair on my neck stand up. The whole thing feels wrong, a total glitch in reality for those few seconds. Then it drops down on all fours, tearing off back down the gully with unnatural speed. I don't chase it. No, I'm sitting there for a long minute, trying to get my heart to stop pounding. Logically, it should have ended there. I should have packed up, gone back to my car, maybe joked about heat stroke to the rangers before getting the hell out of there. Instead, after taking a long pull of my water... I keep going up the trail. Figure I'll check out the ridge view, then turn back the way I came. Something fell off, though. That dry quiet seemed louder now. Noticed I could swear there were footprints alongside mine, overlapping like two people took the same trail, or one thing shifting shape from time to time. 
I hit the open ridge line. You can pretty much see the whole valley spread out below. Stunning view, and terrible at the same time. That feeling of being so tiny, so alone, hit me in a way it never had before. Should have left then. It would have been the smarter thing to do. Instead, I keep walking along the ridge line. And that's when I see him. It's hard to tell how far off he is at first, crouched on the next hunk of rock just where the trail starts dipping downhill. A hunched form, silhouetted against the bright sky. I figure it's just another hiker, someone I didn't hear approach. Then I notice how long he stays there, unmoving. And how that silhouette looks all out of proportion, the limbs a bit too long, head tipped too far forward. I freeze in place, the midday sun starting to make me regret all of this. I pull out my binoculars again, focus in on him. The second I do, he whips his head toward me, like he can sense it. In that same instant, I take in those eyes, deep set, glowing yellow even in the harsh light. I've never seen anything like it. Not a human, not an animal. Without taking my eyes off him, I fumble for my pack, the water bottle. One sip to calm my nerves, another to splash over my face. When I look back up, he's closer. Must have skirted down one side of the ridge without me noticing. There's something in his hands, and my brain finally catches up. Dragging half a torso, human in shape, a bloody trail behind it on the dusty ground. No time to be shocked, only to move. I dropped my pack, took off at a dead run back the way I came. Heard a piercing cry like that thing on the other side of the gully made. Could feel its eyes on my back, hot as the damned sun. The trail snaked downhill, rocks slipping under my feet, and even worse, there were exposed spots for stretches with nowhere to hide. I expected every turn to lead me straight into its claws. Kept running until I felt like I was about to collapse. No sign of pursuit, but no sign of my car either. Maybe the trail took a weird turn that my panic didn't register? Every shadow played tricks on my eyes, saw that hunched shape leaping for me with every jump. It felt like hours later that I came across something, not my car but an old abandoned shack. Had to be from when this area was mine back in the day. Stumbled inside, slammed the door, whatever flimsy wood there was barely bolted together. Took me several gasping breaths to realize how small a hiding place it was. One window. Nowhere to run if it found me here. Heard a scrabbling at the door that sent me fumbling in my pockets for my pocket knife. Nothing against something that size, I knew, but at least something. Then the scuttling stopped. Figured it was smarter than it looked, circling to flush me out. Didn't know which was worse, waiting inside for what was certain to be my slow death, or chancing it back out with that scorching desert as my escape route. The heat got worse as the afternoon passed. My water bottle was long empty thirst burning in my throat. Then from outside the shack, I heard another voice. He sounded almost normal, but hoarse and strained. He told me that I should open the door. It wasn't safe out there during the day. It'll see you for sure then. Told me there were tunnels under the place, safe to crawl through, if you knew the way. A part of me was screaming that it was a trick, maybe both of them in it together but most of me knew those glowing eyes had seen me out there already. Dying slowly from dehydration wasn't exactly a better plan. I opened that flimsy door a crack, knife pointed forward. There he was, middle-aged guy, clothes shredded, covered in dust. Looked wild-eyed, but alive. And behind him, there was indeed a hole in the floor, going into darkness. He told me his name was Vance, and all I could mutter was a choked out. What the hell was that thing? 
He just shook his head. Didn't have an answer. Said a bunch in this area have encountered them. Some live, some don't. But mostly people never believe those that survive. He was half right, seeing as even I thought he might be part of the trap. I don't know how long we waited down there. Days, maybe. Vance knew enough to ration out a tiny bit of water he salvaged from somewhere, split a single energy bar, the only food either of us had left. Said nothing hunted in those old mine tunnels, not like it did above. Told me I should run at night, make for the nearest road, might get cell service, might not. Didn't see the thing again up top, though the whole desert just felt wrong to me as I crept in the moonlight. Never found my car. Eventually staggered onto a highway, flagged down a trucker. Gave the police everything when they came Vance disappeared a while after. They looked into it, found some missing person cases out this way stretching back who knows how long, all unsolved. Officially? Wild animal attacks, probably mountain lions. I know better. Got back home. Tried to explain it to friends, to my girl. None of them believe a word of it. Even I get it. Sounds crazy out loud. They start asking why I didn't stay put, find shelter, and there's no good answer for that either. Just instinct, some part of me knowing you don't fight a skinwalker unless you know all their tricks. And I sure as hell don't. All I can do is never go near a place like that again. There's no going back now. You don't recover from being hunted like that. It happened a few years back, when I took a seasonal job as a fire lookout down in Big Cypress. Me, I'm no city boy, been hunting and fishing these parts all my life. Name's Hayes. Grew up in a trailer on the edge of the Mikasuki Reservation. Learned to track a buck and gig a frog before I could ride a bike. Figured a few months up a lonely tower away from people and their drama sounded like paradise. My tower sat on a raised hummock in the middle of the swamp. Took a half-day slog by airboat to get there. Followed by a climb that tested my fear of heights. But once up top... It was something else. Miles of sawgrass and cypress strands stretching out forever, the sky so big it made you feel small in a good way. I spent the days scanning for smoke trails, nights watching stars wheel overhead. Supplies came in by helicopter drop every couple of weeks. Routine stuff, until one drop went sideways. Heard the chopper coming in, buzzing down out of the clouds, and went out onto the tower's railed walkway to signal the pilot. Then the load snagged on something, a cypress snag I figured I hadn't spotted before. Chopper lurched. Supply crate broke loose. Went plummeting down toward the tree lean, trailing a snapped cable. I swore, figured I was in for a long hike to retrieve it. Then I heard it not the sound of the crate hitting the swamp. A scream, cut short. Human, I'd swear it on anything holy. Didn't hesitate. Radioed the base about the lost supplies, not mentioning that scream, then started down the tower rungs faster than safety protocols allowed. By the time I hit the ground, adrenaline was pumping like rocket fuel. Figured it was probably some poacher, maybe got tangled in the cable but best to check if someone was hurt. Followed the tracks the dropped crate made through the sawgrass, pushing into a stand of dwarf cypress. No sign of the crate, though. Unease grew with every step. It was too quiet. Even the usual buzz of insects seemed muted, like the swamp itself was holding its breath. Then I found the clearing. Not a big one, trampled vegetation all around a mud pit. That's where I saw the bodies. Two of them. One tangled in the chopper cable, neck bent at an impossible angle, 
eyes staring sightlessly up at me. The other, it was sprawled on the edge of the water. What was left of it? I retched while stinging my throat. Whatever did this, it wasn't an alligator. No gator rips a man to pieces like this. Limbs torn away. Trails of blood smeared like crimson finger paintings across the mud. Chest cavity split open, ribs jutting out like broken branches. And the smell. God, the smell. Like roadkill mixed with low tide, all turned up a notch and left to rot in the sun. The splashing came from the cypress knees surrounding the mud pit. Movement, something big and dark. Instinct screamed at me to run, but my legs froze, my brain unable to process what my eyes were seeing. It reared up from the water. Two long legs, each ending in a massive claw. Thick torso covered in scales that glinted a dirty green in the patchy sunlight. A head like a heron's, all beak and beady eyes, but three times the size. It regarded me a moment, then shrieked a sound that set my teeth on edge. I fumbled for the pistol on my hip, fired a shot more out of blind panic than any hope of stopping it. The creature hissed, a spray of foul-smelling liquid spattering the leaves. It lunged. I turned and ran. No plan, just the primal need to get away from that monstrous bird thing. Crashed through the undergrowth, heart pounding like a war drum. Mud sucked at my boots. Branches tore at my skin. The rasping hisses and the crackle of it thrashing through the brush followed on my heels. Stumbled out onto a game trail. Half blind with fear, I sprinted for the open expanse of sawgrass, hoping it was too big to follow. A shriek split the air, a sound of pure, hungry rage. I risked a glance back. It bounded from the undergrowth, moving with shocking speed and agility for its size. Sunlight flashed off its scales, that beak snapping open and shut. I swore, stumbled, and then the trail dipped down, tripped and went sprawling into a ditch, slamming my ribs into something hard. Must have blacked out for a moment. Came to sputtering, half-submerged in stagnant water noise thundered in my skull. It towered over me, outlined against the harsh glare of the midday sun. I scrabbled back, fumbled for my pistol again, lost it in the fall. It tilted its head, studying me. The stink of it washed over me in a wave. Then, as abruptly as it appeared, it turned away, loping into the deeper swamp on those long, clawed legs. The crackle of brush faded, swallowed by the oppressive silence. I stayed there, huddled in the ditch, long after it was gone. Didn't try to move until the sun started to dip low. Reckon shock kept me alive more than smarts that day. Somehow, I made it back to the tower, radioed in a garbled message, something about a poacher attack, accident with the supply drop. They didn't question it much. Evac Chopper was there within the hour. Never spoke the full truth to anyone. Don't think they would have believed me anyway. But I never went back up that tower, not even to collect my things. Got myself transferred to fire watch in some desert park out west, far from water and the memory of those yellow eyes. Some nights, lying in the dry desert darkness— I swear I hear that shriek, echoing from some swampy recess of my own mind. And the old-timers down at the reservation, they sometimes give me a long, considering look when I pass through. Like they know something they're not telling. Makes me wonder. Maybe those legends they whisper about the swamps, the ones about creatures that walked upright before we did, maybe they ain't just tall tales. Maybe there are things out there in the deep places, things we ain't supposed to see. And maybe they look back at us and see nothing but prey. Some folks call them swamp walkers. Me, I just call them nightmares 
and pray I never meet another one again. This happened to me on July 22, 2006. Funny how the random dates stick, burned into your memory. Names Everett, Everett Barnes. I've worked search and rescue for Olympic National Forest going on seven years now. Before that, I was a park ranger. This place, it gets in your blood. Never married, so the forest is kind of my old lady, demanding, beautiful, and occasionally tries to kill me. I'm on a routine trail sweep, radio check-in scheduled for the top of the hour. It's a clear day, sun filtering through the canopy of old-growth giants. Everything smells damp and alive, bark, moss, the sharp tang of pine needles. It's enough to make you forget the world stretches beyond this tangle of green. Then I see it. A pile of clothes. Neatly folded like someone stripped down for a swim, only there's no creek or lake nearby. I radio it in, my voice a little tight. Dispatch doesn't sound too rattled, says a couple from Portland were reported lost yesterday, matching the clothes description. My pulse thrums in my ears. Finding folks alive, that's the best part of the job. The trail weaves deeper in, and that's when I find it. At first, I think it's a bear kill. There's a carcass, half-eaten, twisted in a way no animal breaks its own body. But then there's the blood spatter, high up on the leaves, and the drag marks leading off the trail and into a thicket of undergrowth. I pull my sidearm, standard protocol, but it feels like a flimsy toy. My fingers tighten on the grip as something rank and bitter floods my nostrils. I follow the marks. Something big tore through those bushes. The air hangs thick with the stench of copper and rot. My boots crunch on something, and I look down. A hand? Severed at the wrist. My stomach heaves. No animal I know does that. There's a noise then. A rustle, and then a low growl that sets the hair on the back of my neck on end. I spin, gun raised, scanning the shadows. Something moves, a flash of dark against the green. Tall, hunched, but moving on two legs. My brain screams bare, but it's wrong. The shoulders are too broad, the head, long, the snout jutting forward lined with teeth like shards of glass. It charges. It moves too fast for its size a blur of matted fur and bared teeth. I fire twice, three times. It roars, a sound filled with fury and something, not natural, something that echoes with a cold intelligence that chills me deeper than the mountain air. I stumble back, losing my footing. The world tilts as I fall. I glimpse the creature leaping toward me, and then blackness. I wake up with my face pressed into the cold mud and something sharp digging into my back. Groaning, I roll over and find myself staring at the gnarled root of a tree, my gun a few feet away. I hurt all over and my head is pounding. There's no sign of the creature. I crawl for the gun, radio it in. I describe the thing the best I can, my voice shaking. Dispatch seems concerned which for them is pretty much losing their minds. A team arrives within the hour, armed to the teeth. They find nothing, no fur, no blood that isn't mine. Officially, it's a mountain lion attack. I don't argue, but I know what I saw. The nightmares start after that. I see its eyes in the darkness, hot and yellow like embers. It crouches in the corner of my room, hunched, waiting. I wake up in a cold sweat, my pulse pounding like a trapped bird against my ribs. They say the folks from Portland were never found. Makes me wonder if whatever I saw out there got them first. Years pass, 
But sometimes, out there in the green silence of the forest, I feel like I'm being watched. They transferred me to desk duty a month back. Told me it was stress, needed a break from the field. Maybe they're right, or maybe they just saw it in my eyes, the same way I saw it in the creatures that day. A few weeks back, there's another report on the radio a group of hikers missing. Dispatch sounds tense. The location, it's near where I found the clothes, the, the hand. My stomach twists. Then, the lead investigator calls out on the air. It's Agent Carter, FBI, some special wildlife crimes division. I've never heard of them. Carter wants to interview me, asks about my encounter. I hesitate, then tell him a watered-down version. Leave out the eyes, the wrongness of the creature. He listens intently, asks about the size, build, markings. There's something in his voice, a tautness I don't like. I hang up feeling unsettled. The woods outside my window seem to crowd in, pressing against the glass. I haven't been sleeping well. The nightmares are back, and they're changing. It's not just the creature I see anymore. It's the missing hikers, faces gaunt and staring, their skin an unnatural pale gray, reaching out to me with skeletal hands. Last night was the worst. In the dream, I was back in the woods, following a trail I didn't recognize. The trees twisted in on themselves, branches like grasping claws. The air tasted of iron. I came to a clearing, and it was there, standing amidst a circle of stones. It wasn't hunched anymore, but towering tall, its eyes burning. And it spoke, not in words, but in a feeling like cold dread seeping through my skin directly into my bones. I woke screaming, and I still feel it in my blood, the knowledge that the creature, it waits. It knows me. I'm not sure it's done with me yet. Locals call it the goat man. Honestly, I wish it was something so easily explained. I remember the unbearable itch on my left ankle, aggravated by the tall grasses brushing against it as I questioned Isadora Jenkins about her husband's disappearance. We stood on the edge of the vast Rahway River Park in New Jersey. The scenery was breathtaking, but I couldn't shake the lingering concern that today was going to be intense. Isadora's voice quivered as she spoke. He only took the dog for a walk in the woods. I never imagined he'd go missing like this. I looked intently at Isadora. My name is Ethan Russell, and this is what I do. As a search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service, I've heard numerous stories of lost loved ones and unexplained disappearances. As our search commenced, we found no traces of her husband or their dog. As we ventured deeper into the forest, though, something out of place caught my eye, a crumpled cigarette pack half buried in dirt. That's odd, muttered Samuel Foster one of our team members who noticed it, too. You reckon Isadora's old man was a secret smoker? I shrugged noncommittally and laughed half-heartedly. Well, stranger things have happened in these woods. As night approached, our progress slowed. The park's thick canopy seemed to swallow all remaining light as shadows lengthened eerily. We were tired and hungry but equally determined not to give up. Then... We stumbled across it, or rather him, Douglas Jenkins, tied to a tree trunk with long strands of vine-like rope, his chest mutilated horribly. The wind shushed through the trees above us as if it carried secrets too dark for human ears, punctuating the evening's unease. We quickly circled around his lifeless body, his face contorted into an expression of utter terror. Rooted where he lay, Isadora's golden retriever yelped pathetically, more whine than bark. The creature responsible for this heinous act had left a grisly scene in its wake. We backed away cautiously,
panic whispered on our breaths as we processed the gruesome sight. A detailed description of the attack read like a feverish nightmare, even after years of working in search and rescue. Suddenly, a feral snarl echoed behind us, and everyone instinctively prepared themselves, weapons at the ready. Lurking in the shadows was something not quite human nor animal unimaginable. Its twisted form revealed a sickly gray-skinned creature with piercing yellow eyes, rows of jagged teeth glistening like icicles from its sinister grin. As it lunged towards us, I fired my gun. My aim was true. The creature stumbled back for a moment before quickly retaliating. Flecks of inky black blood stained the grass beneath it. My heart pounded as the creature charged again, its teeth snapping at the air mere inches from me. My teammates and I continued to fight back with everything we had, lodging bullets and swipes between frenzied retreats. The beast roared in fury, relentless in its pursuit. Run! shouted our team leader, Sarah. However, as we attempted to flee, the creature caught hold of Sarah's leg with its massive claws, dragging her back towards its twisted form. No! I cried out in terror, watching as Sarah struggled against its grip. The reprieve gifted by my earlier shot was gone. The creature seemed to grow more ferocious by the second. Noticing an abandoned campsite not far from us, I took my chances and darted towards it. Everyone, follow me! I yelled. We sprinted through the woods attempting to stay ahead of the monstrous abomination even as it snarled menacingly behind us. Reaching the campsite, I spotted a flare gun in one of the tents perhaps left behind by previous ill-fated hikers. Snatching it up with trembling hands, I knew I had to try anything to save Sarah and ourselves from the gruesome fate that lay ahead. I fired the flare gun directly at the creature just as it was about to reach for another one of my teammates. The flare exploded against its body in a dazzling display of light and sound, forcing it to recoil momentarily in pain. Call for help! I urged my team as we temporarily gained distance from our attacker. We immediately pulled out our radios and desperately attempted to establish contact with anyone who could help us out of this nightmare. As luck would have it, a group of off-duty police officers had received an emergency distress signal and were nearby. The sirens drew closer by the second. But time was running out and as we frantically regrouped at the edge of a nearby clearing, the beast charged once more, flinging Sarah aside as it focused on the rest of us. With a sudden burst of sirens and lights, the police arrived just in time, unloading their weapons at the rampaging creature. Their unified assault was finally enough to bring it down. The thing let out one final guttural growl before collapsing to the ground, lifeless. As we stood there catching our breath, officers tended to the wounded Sarah and checked on the rest of us. We thanked them for their timely intervention and shared trembling glances between ourselves we knew how close we had come to certain death. Word quickly spread about our harrowing encounter in the woods, igniting a wildfire of theories about what that creature might have been. Some argued it was an undiscovered species— Others whispered about dark government experiments gone wrong. The truth was certainly out there, but all I cared about was that my team and I had survived against all odds. Sarah eventually recovered from her injuries and joined us once more in search and rescue missions, though she was never quite the same after that encounter. However, one thing became clear no matter how much darkness lay within those woods— we would never stop searching for those lost within its depths. It all started when I lost my wallet while hiking alone in the remote wilderness of the Appalachian Trail. My name is Elias Townsend. Normally, I wouldn't worry about such a minor inconvenience— but my credit cards, cash, and most importantly, my ID were gone. I knew it would be a pain when I returned to civilization, 
but for now, all I could do was laugh at my carelessness and continue forward. As I pushed through the dense foliage, the sun began to set. The once picturesque scenery began transforming into shadowy figures looming before me. The chirping of birds slowly changed into sinister whispers carried by the soft breeze. Realizing that I didn't want to be stuck in this creepy forest after dark, I quickened my pace. A couple of hours later, I came across an abandoned log cabin a rare relic within the vast wilderness. The presence of an old structure was unexpected but certainly welcome as it gave me something to joke about to myself. At least this isn't one of those horror movies where they stumble upon an abandoned cabin in the woods, right? Little did I know that there was more truth to my jest than I could ever have imagined. Inside the cabin, I found traces of makeshift furniture and a cold fireplace covered in soot. Struggling to keep my eyes open, I decided to build a fire and rest until morning. Not long after falling asleep, though, I was awakened by peculiar scratching sounds coming from outside the cabin walls. At first, it seemed like just another creepy nocturnal visitor trying their luck on a defenseless hiker. That's what you get hiking alone unprepared. Curiosity consumed me as the noise grew louder and closer. Peering through a gap in one of the wood panels, utterly shocked by what faced me tall and grotesque with elongated limbs that seemed impossible under biological laws, its head adorned with sharp antlers, mimicking the shape of a deer skull. As it walked in a twisted, unnatural gait around the cabin, my heartbeat quickened, and I subconsciously held my breath. Surely this was one of those wild hallucinations they warn you about in survival shows? But the nightmare before me was unmistakable. Around the same time that desperation started creeping in, I remembered my smartphone. I could try to call for help. But with no signal and only 10% battery left, what good would it do? Frustration welled up inside me as I had willingly brought myself into this situation with per planning and now banking on someone else to save me. Waiting for the creature to leave felt like an eternity. When finally there was no sign or sound of it, I cautiously stepped out, armed with a broken branch and dwindling courage. The forest appeared normal again perhaps the monster was just a figment of my overactive imagination. I decided to make my way back to the trail and continue searching for help while clutching my makeshift defense weapon. The sun pierced through the trees, giving off an eerie golden glow that seemed to be mocking me as if nature itself had conspired against my fate. As the day progressed, the tranquility of nature returned, making it difficult to digest what I had seen earlier. Was that creature really roaming these woods? Backtracking along the path towards civilization still held uncertainties. Each rustle in the underbrush brought me closer to panicking but also edged on a comical dread. You know you're losing it when you start making jokes about a thing because you can't handle what you saw. And laughter began bubbling inside. It wasn't long before I found myself face to face with the abomination once more. Emerging from undergrowth, like some twisted fairy tale creature brought to life by evil forces, it sauntered forward each long stride in exercise and physical agony. Its deer like features froze within proximity, and for the first time, I tried to gain some sense as to what it was doing. I couldn't waste any more time trying to comprehend this unnatural being. My instincts urged me to escape and to find help. In a split second, I turned on my heels and sprinted in the opposite direction. Dread filled my chest as I heard it following me, its heavy steps cracking branches and crunching leaves on the forest floor. I pushed myself harder, feeling the burning in my muscles. My breath was ragged, and sweat soaked my clothes. Suddenly I stumbled and fell to the ground with a hard thud, pain shooting through my entire body. Ignoring the pain, I forced myself up and attempted to put more distance between that creature and me. But with each step I took, 
it only got closer. I soon realized that running would be insufficient to save me from its clutches. A quick glance around revealed a large tree with thick branches. It was risky, but it was all I had. Pushing my exhausted body toward the tree, I began to climb as fast as my jittery limbs would allow. As I clambered higher into the tree's safety, it let out a guttural growl that shook me to the core. But despite its horrific form, it could not appear to climb or follow me upwards. Feeling a slight flicker of relief, I mustered up enough courage to shout for help, hoping someone could hear me amidst this dreadful forest. Help! Can anybody hear me? Help! My voice echoed through the woods. Desperate pleas went unanswered. The creature let out another monstrous snarl. Frustration was evident in its movements as it paced back and forth beneath the tree. Now was perhaps my only chance, while it was momentarily vexed, to call for help again. Please, somebody! Is anyone out there? My voice broke as fear chased any hope away. Unexpectedly, I heard a faint sound of footsteps approaching. My heart raced, torn between joy at the prospect of help and dread that they too might fall victim to this abomination. Hey! Up here! It was the first time I dared to look down the tree. I caught a glimpse of a figure. It appeared human, perhaps someone who could help me. But as the figure emerged from the shadows, my heart sank. It wasn't alone. Several other creatures like the one below me flanked the newcomer. I could see each one more terrifying than the last all with gruesome features. The person didn't stand a chance against such an army of monstrosities. In a flash, I knew what I had to do, warn them before it was too late. Stop! Run! There are dangerous creatures here! I practically screamed down to them. The encroaching group halted, most of them hesitating while others observing their surroundings with visible fear and confusion. A shared plan took form among them as they turned and sprinted away from the horrifying scene, leaving me alone again with my nightmare. Time seemed to stand still while I hung on to the tree, praying those creatures wouldn't return. Darkness crept in as night enveloped the forest, swallowing any remaining light. Hours bled into each other and at last, groggy and numb from my ordeal on the tree, daylight seeped through leaves canopy above me. Cautiously climbing down when there were no signs of those horrific beings, I felt an overwhelming urge to find my way back home, wherever that was. This nightmare had to end. Before leaving, I solemnly thought about those strangers who encountered unspeakable terror because they heard my cries for help. Reflecting on their bravery and sacrifice fueled determination in my exhausted body. On shaking legs, I made my way toward civilization through that once tranquil forest now haunted by secrets best left untold never looking back. I still remember that fateful moment when everything changed. It was a chilly morning, and the sound of the truck's engine roared as I navigated the desolate highway. My name is Malcolm Jensen, a truck driver for fifteen years now, delivering goods all across the United States. To keep myself awake, I often found entertainment in counting how many times a song changed on the radio between stops. It was an incredibly mundane task, but who could blame me? Life on the road can be dull. As I drove through a remote area in the USA, specifically the Mojave Desert in California, my focus was suddenly taken by a gruesome sight. Lying off to the side of the road was what appeared to be a mangled carcass of an animal. The creature had been so mutilated that it was hard to recognize what type of species it once belonged to. My stomach churned at the sight, and I couldn't help but make up a little joke in my head to lighten my mood. That fella must have had one heck of an argument with its girlfriend. Continuing along that lonesome stretch of highway, 
I noticed something outside an abandoned car on the side of the road. Pulling over to investigate seemed like a good idea, considering someone out here might need assistance. As I approached the vehicle, I saw claw marks gouging the paint and strange footprints leading from it footprints that didn't seem human. It wasn't long after that I spotted him a man in torn and ragged clothes standing near another abandoned car further up ahead. His face was gaunt and battered with an unusual hue that matched the dirt beneath our feet. Every fiber of my being warned me to stay away from this stranger. Despite my instincts, I called out to him as I approached with caution, asking if he needed help or if there were other people nearby. He didn't respond, grunting nonsensically before continuing his strange limping walk. The ghastly sight of his injuries and the peculiar aspect he presented was excessively unsettling. Confused and alarmed, I searched for my cell phone to call for help. My hands fumbled in panic when I realized I'd accidentally left it at the last truck stop. With no way to contact anyone, I could only continue to observe the man hoping he wouldn't notice me. Suddenly he stopped and turned around, staring directly at me with an emotionless expression that sent chills down my spine. Two broken bottles gripped within his hands glistened under the sunlight. It was then when I realized that he wasn't just hurt but rather a potential threat. My mind raced, trying to recall where I had kept my shotgun back in the truck. Terror took hold as the man started limping towards me with purpose a sinister grin beginning to form on his face. Now desperate for any kind of defense, I frantically searched through my truck and pulled out a tire iron from under a pile of blankets not perfect like my shotgun but enough to fend him off if it came down to it. Gripping the tire iron tight, I swung it through the air once or twice just to make sure our troubled stranger could see that I wasn't defenseless. As if sensing this subtle shift in power, he cautiously halted his advance. Unfortunately, our standoff didn't last long. While we stood there anxiously staring at each other, something else began to happen. From all around us emerged similarly disheveled individuals, their faces bizarrely altered and far more menacing than the initial man. The rising tension rendered me speechless as they began to converge onto my location wary of my makeshift weapon yet seemingly undeterred by my attempt at showing strength. Surrounded by these menacing figures, I knew I couldn't fight them off alone. Lifting the tire iron above my head in a final act of desperation, I shouted at the top of my lungs, hoping someone nearby would hear my plea for help. Among the growing crowd of hostile faces, one person heard my call. A trucker, who had just stopped to refuel at the same station, came running towards me wielding a heavy wrench as his weapon. Seeing this unexpected reinforcement, our adversaries seemed to lose some of their previous conviction, hesitating for a moment, as if weighing options. The pause allowed us to exchange quick nods of understanding before stepping back to back to stand our ground together. One of our would-be attackers tried to test his luck against the trucker. Swinging his wrench effectively, the trucker struck the man in the chest with a sickening crunch that echoed throughout my entire body. The injured attacker fell to the ground gasping for air while his accomplices started to murmur angrily among themselves. Tensions were visibly escalating on both sides as we fought to hold our ground while they regrouped. The standoff continued until the wailing sound of approaching sirens grew louder, signaling that someone had called for help. Lucky for me, my distressful scream not only rallied an ally but caught the attention of others who alerted law enforcement. As flashing red and blue lights drew nearer, our enemies scattered like rats fleeing sinking ship. They disappeared into the surrounding woods and alleyways, dragging their wounded comrade with them and leaving us bewildered but alive in their wake. Police came speeding into the parking lot to find us standing there dazed and breathless amidst the remnants of the encounter, broken bottles glittering in puddles of crimson on now abandoned asphalt. We tried our best to provide them with accounts of what had transpired, 
struggling to capture every detail our shocked minds could recall. Detectives took over the scene as EMS arrived to treat our minor injuries and ensure that shock didn't overtake us. They couldn't help the ones who'd gotten away, but they checked us thoroughly and commended our efforts to stay alive. In a bittersweet turn, our unlikely camaraderie forged in the crucible of this brutal encounter had also resulted in the serious injury of one attacker, felled by the trucker's mighty wrench. The news weighed heavily on my new friend as he grappled with the harsh reality of his necessary self-defense. As we sat on the ambulance bumper, side by side, shaken yet grateful for having survived, the detectives promised they'd exhaust all leads to find those who attacked us. And though we held reservations about retribution being served, for they knew nothing about these men or their motivations— we took solace in having survived against all odds. We exchanged contact information and expressed our thanks to one another before eventually parting ways, bound by an experience that would forever be seared into our memories. Countless sleepless nights lay ahead with nightmares replaying the confrontation, a lasting reminder of the strangers who nearly took our lives. I found myself deep within Sequoia National Park, surrounded by the ancient forest and the echoes of long-forgotten tales. In these woods, stories seemed to thrive legends of hidden treasures and unsettling encounters that left travelers forever changed. My name is Landon Abernathy, an avid hiker who has always been curious about the mysterious places this world holds. A stiff breeze rustled through the trees as I continued on my hike, astounding me with the raw beauty of this land. As I made my way through the towering sequoias, I stumbled upon an old cabin with the door barely hanging onto its hinges. Curiosity peaked as I entered the dilapidated structure it had probably been abandoned for decades. Inside I discovered a well-thumbed journal, carefully held together with brittle twine. It belonged to a man named Alaric Foschetti, and detailed his restless hunt for what he believed was an undiscovered creature lurking in these very woods. Before I could examine further, a chilling cry echoed through the air, snapping me out of my trance. Instinctively, like any rational person would have done in that moment, I grabbed my phone intent on calling for help but there was no signal this deep into the park. Panic set in as I realized my isolation. The eerie cry persisted. It was either human nor animal, but an amalgamation of both. With each passing minute, my pulse quickened as terror coursed through my body, yet part of me was captivated by Alaric's writings and shared his desire to uncover the legend stalking these woods. As night fell, Plagued by unnerving sounds and shadowy movements in the periphery of my vision, unease became my constant companion. A fire crackled beside me. Flames flickered as if reflecting my own wavering courage. Suddenly, a silhouette darker than the surrounding woods revealed itself at the edge of my campsite. The creature was large, with long unkempt fur and jagged teeth protruding from its grotesque muzzle. From this distance, it was impossible to discern any more details. But simply by the way it moved, I could tell that it wasn't anything I had seen in all my years of hiking. What are you? I stammered, voice barely a whisper. The creature remained silent, instilling terror like whispered words in my ears. My hand trembled as I reached for the hunting knife strapped to my belt a final thought of self-defense before accepting the encroaching darkness. With another guttural cry, the hulking form lunged towards me. Suddenly, a shot rang out. Lorcan Naylor, the park ranger, emerged from behind me. The bullet harmlessly struck a nearby tree, betraying his shaky hands, but it was enough to scare off the monstrous vision along with our composure. Lorcan and I exchanged glances and nodded solemnly, 
We both knew that this was far more than we bargained for. As we began retracing our steps in search of safety, an unsettling truth dawned on me. Alaric's obsessive quest had somehow ensnared us into its relentless jaws. Now bound by a terrifying encounter and an oath to uncover the truth of the ghastly legend we faced in these woods, an ordeal that would haunt us long after we left Sequoia National Park behind. A storm approached overhead while we marched in hurried yet determined strides through Sequoia's wilderness. Lightning flashed and illuminated the path before us. Suddenly mid-step, Lorcan disappeared from sight. Help me! He screamed as a clawed grip dragged him into shadows beyond. Desperate to save Lorcan before it was too late, I plunged into darkness reaching for my friend who now faced unimaginable horror. The cold depths of Sequoia's secrets weighed heavily upon us as the past buried deep within me ached for answers to questions I dared not ask. As the storm roared above, I heard the haunting howl of our wicked nemesis gain volume, and a mortal cry pierced through its oppression. Landon! Help Dash! The plea was cut short by an anguished wail that seared through me and clawed at my soul. I sprinted towards the source of Lorcan's screams, my heart pounding painfully in my chest. The thought of losing my friend to what seemed like a creature from the darkest depths of a nightmare fueled my desperation. Deep scratches marred the forest floor where Lorcan had struggled against his attacker. As I frantically searched for any sign of him, I caught sight of shredded clothing and blood smeared on tree trunks. Panicking, I shouted for help hoping that someone would hear my voice and come to our aid. But we were deep in the wilderness, far from any potential rescuers. The storm overhead masked my cries, rendering them futile. As I continued searching, I stumbled upon a gruesome sight. The mangled body of Alaric lay on the ground, the once bold and determined man reduced to unrecognizable carnage. Tears blurred my vision as I realized that the creature might have done the same to Lorcan. Driven by fear and determination, I pushed onward with renewed urgency. Then, in the distance, I spotted something large crouching over a huddled mass. It was the creature looming over Lorcan. The beast was even more terrifying up close. It had jagged claws and layers of thick matted fur that covered its muscular body. Sharp fangs protruded from its elongated snout, and it seemed to effortlessly blend into the shadows that surrounded it. Not knowing what else to do, I picked up a large rock and hurled it at the monstrous being with all my strength. It struck its back, and with a snarl, it turned its glowing eyes towards me. Taking advantage of the creature's momentary distraction, Lorcan managed to break free from its grip and scrambled toward me. We ran together as fast as our legs could carry us, not daring to look back for fear of seeing that monstrous visage hot on our heels. Our breaths came in ragged gasps as we raced along the darkened forest path, every ounce of energy poured into escaping the unfolding nightmare. The sound of claws tearing at the forest floor seemed to be never-ending, and I knew the dreaded creature was still pursuing us. We avoided the main roads, fearing that the beast would be waiting for us there. Instead, we stumbled upon a ranger station where we finally found refuge. Exhausted and beaten, we reluctantly shared our harrowing tale with the rangers on duty. Though they tried to remain professional, I could see disbelief etched on their faces as they listened to our account of the events. Who could blame them? It sounded like an absurd story ripped straight from folklore. They patched up Lorcan's wounds and contacted local search parties to hunt for any signs of Alaric or the creature we had encountered. Though they didn't say anything, we knew they expected to find a bear or a wild animal instead of a monstrous beast. Inevitably, weeks turned into months since our fateful encounter in Sequoia National Park. Lorcan and I had become closer due to what we had gone through together, 
bound by a secret neither of us expected nor wanted. One day when I was alone in my apartment, I decided to do some research on creatures that may have resembled what I saw. After extensive digging and dismissing countless fantasy creatures and mythological beasts from various cultures, I found something with uncanny similarities. It was an old legend of something called a Wendigo. The creature was described as tall with elongated limbs, fur-covered skin, and had glowing eyes that could see through darkness. It was said that the Wendigo hunted humans deep in forests and fed on their flesh. The descriptions matched closely with what I still saw in my nightmares, yet despite it being right there in front of me, disbelief clouded my thoughts. A creature out of legend, how could it have come to life? The memories were ingrained in my mind, but the reality of what we experienced became increasingly difficult to accept. As life went on, Lorcan and I found solace in forcing the memories to the recesses of our minds. Years passed, and slowly but surely, the haunting visions faded into an unsettling, distant past. Reminders of that night were locked away both physically and emotionally, and we carried on with our lives. But the shadow of Sequoia National Park would forever cast its darkness over our souls. I smirked as I stepped into the dense woods of Wyandotte County Lake Park, Kansas, gripping my rifle tightly. It felt like home every time I ventured into these parts. They called me Conrad Mitchum, a master hunter and an expert in tracking. A subtle breeze rustled through the trees as the sun cast eerie shadows among the foliage. I thought about my childhood we were a family of hunters, loyal to tradition. My father taught me everything there is to know about hunting. In the distance, I noticed something peculiar a car abandoned on the side of the trail. The sight was strange for such a remote area. Investigating it further, I realized the driver's door hung open and there was a cell phone on the seat, still blinking with an incoming call. I cautiously followed what appeared to be drag marks in the dirt along the bushes. It led me to a gruesome scene a horribly mutilated body lying motionless on the ground. The victim was beyond recognition, torn apart by some monstrous force. Minutes later, I stumbled upon another body under similar circumstances not far away. Panic began to reveal itself in my rapidly beating heart. There was definitely something sinister lurking in these woods. I scrambled to find higher ground for safety, soon climbing one of the tallest trees in sight. Scanning my surroundings from this newfound vantage point, I could fathom that these killings weren't by any animal I'd ever encountered before. I caught movement in my peripheral vision an enormous creature was slinking between trees at an alarming speed. Its dark fur glistened with thick red liquid as it prowled closer toward yet another unsuspecting camper. I dared not make a sound as it crept closer to its prey. This was no ordinary beast. It almost seemed intelligent, sure-footed, strategic in its moves without a sound or wasted action. In heaven's name, I muttered under my breath, gripping my rifle tighter. The creature swiftly attacked the camper, rendering her lifeless in a blink of an eye. It sniffed the scene and then its beady bloodshot eyes focused directly on me. Petrified, I tried to slink down my tree and sneak away. Unfortunately, my efforts revealed me to the monster. It let out a guttural growl that shook me to my core as it stalked slowly towards my tree, drool dripping from its razor-sharp teeth. I rested one hand on a nearby branch, waiting for the perfect moment to make my move. My heart pounded like a drum in my chest and beads of sweat trickled down my neck as the creature closed in. In that brief instant, I propelled down the tree's base and sprinted with everything I had. 
I maneuvered through the trees like a predator myself, barely keeping ahead of this abomination hot on my tail. As I bolted through the dimly lit forest, adrenaline carried me onward. The sunlight flickered above me like strobe lights at a dance party as I weaved through tall timber and dense brush. Finally, cornered against the cliff's edge, I had nowhere left to run. Above was stone. Below was an enormous plunge into watery uncertainty. Behind me approached this terrorizing beast. With my back against the cold, unyielding rock, I glanced at the cliff's edge to my right. The water below roared and churned angrily. With each breath I took, the monstrous creature advanced, leaving me no choice but to inch closer to oblivion. Stay back! I shouted at the creature, hoping by some miracle that it would pause or retreat. The creature stared at me with its malevolent eyes as it continued its malicious advance, almost as if mocking me. It stood on four legs that appeared more like tree trunks instead of limbs. The thick fur covering its body was matted with what looked like dried blood. It had a long snout filled with razor-sharp teeth perfectly designed for tearing flesh. I knew calling for help would be useless. No one would come in time, even if their ears caught my desperate cries. With every option running dry and my heart pounding against my chest, I made a decision. In one fluid motion, I took out my phone from my pocket and pressed a button while watching the creature's every move. Then I lunged off the cliff's edge. For a moment, time stopped as gravity took hold of me and pulled me towards the raging water below. As hard as my heart pounded before, there was a newfound tranquility in this split second of suspended commotion until it came all too abruptly to an end when I hit the water beneath with a bone-chilling splash. My instincts kicked in and urged me to swim toward the surface as air escaped from my lungs. Lights danced under the churning water before vanishing like fleeting dreams. Unsteadily wading in turbulent waters beneath the cliff, it was then that I noticed what must have been their source. Lights flickered in windows from a town far away. Gaining strength despite desperation's tight grip, I managed to swim toward those distant lights with labored, deliberate strokes. I fought the exhaustion from my body and, with each stroke, distanced myself further from the monster that hunted me mere moments before. Against all odds, I arrived at the river's edge soaking wet, cold, and gasping for air but grateful to be alive. I stumbled into the town, bringing forth a deluge of concerned faces as they stared at the sopping wet figure I had become. Too exhausted to explain my harrowing story of escape, I collapsed into a stranger's arms. When I came to, I found myself lying in a warm bed and surrounded by concerned townsfolk. They treated my wounds and listened intently as I told them about the abomination lurking in the forest by the cliff. Determined to rid their town of this gruesome terror once and for all, they formed a search party. Days passed as they hunted the creature both day and night. Finally, after days of relentless tracking, they cornered it against the same cliff where it had pursued me. The creature fell to its death after a long battle with the townspeople. The town held a memorial service for the camper whose life had been taken by this vicious being. She had been innocently exploring nature's beauty when she happened upon its grotesque fury. There existed no records nor stories shared by locals about any creature that resembled this monstrosity. Its origin remained a terrifying enigma that haunted even those accustomed to living with such wilderness at their doorstep. Life would never quite be the same again innocence marred, fear lurking beneath an illusion of tranquility regained. After all was said and done, my journey led me back home with memories etched into my soul some horrific but others serving as testament to human resilience in even the most petrifying situations. Although the creature had met its end, its hateful gaze painted across those bloodshot eyes would forever stalk me when darkness claimed the world. 
and while the town managed to move forward, we would all carry scars that would always remind us of that gruesome and harrowing encounter with a creature we could not fully understand. This happened to me a decade ago, working as a traveling salesman in a small town called Lothridge. I'm James Vollenheim, a New Yorker by birth, but I found myself drawn to the open road, meeting new folks every few weeks. That's when everything changed. One day, I pulled into Loftridge's lone gas station, wondering why my GPS had led me here. The man behind the counter seemed skittish. People don't come through much, he explained hesitantly. I could tell there was more to it than that, but figured it best not to pry. I checked into a cheap motel before getting dinner at the only diner in town. Again, faces turned away when I entered, and the tense silence was punctuated by hushed murmurs. A man named Jeremy Blakewell decided to approach me. We made small talk until he fumbled nervously with his coffee cup and lowered his voice. I'm not supposed to say anything, but people have been missing around here lately. Jeremy whispered urgently. People had taken wrong turns close by, stammered Alfred Lydgate, another local who'd overheard Jeremy and had come to join our conversation. I was skeptical of their story but decided to check things out anyway. Curiosity had always been part of my charm or my downfall, depending on whom you asked. The next day, I left early, following the path where others had disappeared, at least according to Alfred and Jeremy. Gradually, the maintained road gave way to uneven dirt tracks suddenly. My car protested against the sudden incline of the mountainous terrain and ground to a halt. Cursing under my breath and regretting this decision already, I climbed out of the car. On foot now through dense woodland that obscured anything beyond twenty feet ahead or behind me as it was quickly swallowed by an eerie silence. My instincts screamed, turn back, but it was too late. Up ahead, I spotted fresh footprints in the dirt. Curiously enough, they were barefoot and marked with deep cuts. The realization made my heart pound like a war drum. Someone needed my help. I followed the prince deeper into a canyon, the silence broken by a faint cry for help echoing in the distance. I turned around, only to see a tall man with a wild beard approaching me, shaking his head briefly. You really shouldn't have come here, he said, nodding at someone out of sight. Before I knew it, another man, even larger than the first, appeared next to me. Why not? The question left my lips without thinking when I suddenly noticed something strange about these fellows, like they were predators sizing up their prey. Without another word, the mountain men lunged at me as I tried to run, yet tripped on a rock instead. They grabbed hold of me, their ragged nails tearing through clothes to pierce flesh. The taller one clamped down on my arm with a force that sent shivers down my spine as he locked eyes with mine eyes filled with hunger. That eerie silence only broke when all at once the snarling began, low and menacing as if it were coming from deep within their chests. They dragged me back through the woods while skillfully silencing my cries for help with their twisted limbs. Desperation surged through me as thoughts of being someone's late supper plagued my mind. As if responding to my frenzied thoughts— one of them let out an unnerving cackle followed by. We won't eat you just yet. My body went limp with dread when it hit me. These cannibalistic mountain men hunted anyone who accidentally entered the seemingly abandoned town. But Loftridge's isolation would not guarantee them permanent freedom from discovery or capture any more now since their latest prey had a fighting spirit. Bloody, bruised yet seething with determination— this New Yorker would do everything possible to ensure he wouldn't become another face in the missing person reports. 
Determined to survive, I searched for a way to escape as they dragged me deeper into the woods. My thoughts raced, considering every possibility. They hadn't killed me yet, so there was still time. I became acutely aware of the surrounding sounds. A branch snapped in the distance and water flowed nearby. The water caught my attention. Thirsty? One of the mountain men sneered, noticing my focus on the sound. Here you go! He shoved me into a nearby creek, submerging my face briefly before pulling me back up by my hair. Despair turned into an idea. If I could somehow maneuver my body to wrap around one of the men holding me, maybe I could force him into the water with me and flee while he struggled to get out or drown him in case he pursued me afterward. As I prepared to enact my plan, an unsuspecting figure appeared before us, a hiker. His eyes widened in horror at our grisly group. I tried to call for help, but there's no signal here. He desperately offered an explanation for his intrusion. The mountain men saw him as a threat and released me to lunge at him. Seizing this opportunity, I sprinted away, ignoring the agonizing pain that shot through my bruised body. Although it was tempting to look back and see if they were chasing me or focused on their new prey, I couldn't risk slowing down for even a second. After what felt like hours running through the thick forest, I stumbled upon Loftridge's outskirts. Exhausted and disoriented, relief washed over me as I finally reached some semblance of safety. Quickly finding a vehicle, likely an abandoned pickup truck left behind in haste, I scoured the interior for keys or any other potential defensive items but couldn't find any. Determined not to stand still out in the open and vulnerable any longer, I fashioned a rudimentary weapon using materials like rusty nails and shards of glass found in the truck bed. It wasn't much, but it would have to do until I could find help or at least a working phone to call for assistance. Finally locating the main road leading out of Loftridge, my makeshift weapon in hand, I began my careful journey back towards civilization. Every noise I heard, from rustling leaves to crunching stones underfoot, made me nervously glance over my shoulder, anticipating one of those cannibalistic mountain men emerging from the shadows to recapture me. Daylight waned as I trudged down the road, painstakingly slow due to my injuries and heightened paranoia. Suddenly, ahead just around a bend in the road lay a miraculous sight. The town's sheriff, whose patrol brought him to our nightmarish stomping grounds. Gasping for air between words, I recounted my ordeal and the fate of the unfortunate hiker who had crossed paths with us. My voice trembled with exhaustion and fear as I spoke. The sheriff listened intently as he eased me into his vehicle to check on my wounds. Once he confirmed they weren't life-threatening, we took off down the same road I'd been precariously limping along just moments earlier, bound for safety and medical treatment. While making our way back towards civilization, the sheriff updated me on the ongoing search for others who'd vanished around Loftridge in recent months. Unfortunately, it seemed suboptimal terrain and signal quality significantly hampered rescue efforts in these parts. As we drove further from Loftridge and its gruesome secrets, extreme relief washed over me, gratitude that I had survived despite insurmountable odds confronting those monstrous beings that preyed on unsuspecting passers-by amid that desolate place. Yet that relief felt tinged with sadness too. Thoughts lingered on those who'd crossed paths with the mountain men and been devoured, especially that poor hiker who'd merely been at the wrong place at the wrong time. Despite escaping, those blood-curdling memories and cries for help would haunt me forever. I vowed to fight alongside law enforcement against this lurking evil, even if it meant revisiting that cursed town and confronting the demons lurking deep within Loftridge. No one else should ever have to suffer the same fate.
This happened to me on October 23, 2008. Little cabin up in Maine, family property, mostly used for hunting season. Me? I needed the solitude so I went up there in the off-season. Name's Everett. I work in insurance, dull, but pays the bills. Figured I'd get some writing done, enjoy the stark beauty of the forests in mid-autumn. First couple of weeks were heavenly. Mornings spent hiking, afternoons by the fire with a battered paperback and a mug of strong coffee. But come sundown, my skin would start to prickle. You get that feeling sometimes, in isolated places, like something's out there. Most folks dismiss it as nerves. I've always had a strong streak of stubborn practicality, so I told myself it was deer, or maybe a coyote at most. Then came the noises. Thumps against the cabin walls at night. At first, I chalked it up to branches swaying in the wind. But some nights there wasn't any breeze to speak of, yet the thumps persisted. It got so bad I started leaving the outside floodlights on. That's when I saw the track's huge prints circling the cabin. Deep, with too many claws to belong to anything natural. They made my stomach turn. That was my first mistake, not leaving right then. But pride's a funny thing. I wasn't about to be scared out of my own family's cabin. Loaded Grandpa's old shotgun instead. It came a few nights later. I was jolted awake by scratching sounds, low and relentless, like claws against the window pane. My heart pounded in my chest, so loud I was sure whatever was outside could hear it. I didn't dare turn on the light. Just crept over to the window, shotgun trembling in my hands. Moonlight cast stark shadows, making the trees look like twisted skeletal hands. That's when I saw it. Crouched below the window. Impossibly tall, hunched over on its powerful hind legs that ended in vicious claws. Its head swung towards me, and even in the darkness, its eyes shone like burning embers. It looked scaly somehow, its skin stretched over ridged muscles that flexed as it shifted closer. Its snout was long and jagged, teeth peeking out as it opened its jaws in a silent hiss. For a wild second, I thought about firing a warning shot, but some deep, primal part of me whispered that it was a bad idea. I eased back from the window, my pulse a painful roar in my ears. The creature didn't leave. It paced back and forth along the side of the cabin, sniffing at the walls, raking its claws over the old wood. I crouched there, shotgun clutched to my chest, waiting for the inevitable crash of shattering glass. Days bled together after that. I barely slept, subsisting on cold soup and crackers. Tried to call the local rangers, but my cell service cut in and out. I thought about hiking out, but what if that thing was waiting in the woods? Safer to stay put, I told myself, even though every fiber of my being screamed at me to run. Then one night there was a new sound, a low, keening whine. It raised the hair on my arms, sent shivers down my spine. The whines got louder, more insistent. And then they were joined by the heavy thud of something moving around the cabin. More than one. I counted three distinct sets of those inhuman footprints in the mud the next day. They had me surrounded. And whatever they were, they were growing impatient. The night after that, I made a decision. Wasn't going to wait for them to work up the gumption to storm the cabin. Loaded my few belongings into my old pickup, the shotgun beside me on the seat. As I pulled out of the driveway, I glanced back. There, watching me from the edge of the tree lean, stood three of them. Tall, grotesque silhouettes against the fading light. I'll never forget those glowing eyes, nor the way the lead creature tilted its head, almost as if in mockery. I floored the accelerator and didn't look back. It's been years now. 
still have no idea what those things were. Local legends around Maine talk about a Wendigo, some kind of spirit driven mad by hunger. Could be, I don't know. Only know that they're still out there, and part of me, a twisted, desperate part, yearns to go back. Maybe take a few buddies. Do some hunting of my own. That feeling festered. Never left me entirely. I got back to the city, tried to bury myself in routine. My insurance job seemed even duller than before, the chatter of my co-workers an irritating buzz compared to the haunting silence of the woods. Jumped at the slightest noise, saw shadows twist into monstrous shapes at night. Slept, when I could, with a shotgun propped beside my bed. People noticed, of course. My boss gave me concerned looks. My girlfriend suggested therapy. I brushed them off with grim humor, said it was stress, too much work. But inside, the seed of an idea was taking root. I hadn't gone back to the cabin, but neither had the creatures. Part of me wondered if I'd imagined them, a breakdown brought on by isolation. But the other part, the part that had survived, that part knew better. I hit the library, not the shiny one downtown, but a musty old place tucked between a pawn shop and a Chinese takeout. The back shelves housed books on folklore, strange tales, the type my practical mind used to scoff at. I dove into descriptions of cryptids, local Native American legends, anything about creatures with glowing eyes and a hunger for human flesh. That old main legend of the Wendigo, it resurfaced alongside other disturbing snippets of tales. Turns out those woods had a dark history. Isolated incidents over centuries, settlers disappearing, hunters found mutilated, a cryptic warning carved on a tree trunk back in the 1800s. Not enough to paint a complete picture, but enough to confirm I wasn't crazy. That's when the plan started to form. See, I'm not a hunter by nature. A few squirrel hunts with my grandpa as a kid, that was about it. But I know how to follow directions, learn new skills. The internet is a wonderful, horrible thing, full of detailed manuals and how to OS on everything from field dressing deer to assembling a rifle from scratch. My routine changed. I quit the insurance job, citing personal reasons. Ignored my worried girlfriend's calls, telling myself it was for the best. Gym sessions turned from treadmill jogs to strength training. I spent my evenings poring over survivalist websites, taking meticulous notes. Bought a used jeep, replaced basic parts until it was sturdy enough for backcountry roads. Got myself a hunting license, spent hours at the shooting range until I could group my shots with deadly accuracy. It wasn't just about revenge, I told myself. It was about not being a victim anymore, taking control. The aftermath? Well, that part isn't written yet. I head back up to that main cabin next week. Bait, I learned, is key when you're dealing with predators. I'll leave a gutted deer carcass just off the property line, laced with enough tranquilizers to knock out a horse, but not enough to kill. Need one of those creatures alive, just for a little while. Got myself a heavy-duty cage, custom-built and reinforced. Haul that into the woods, set it near the carcass. Got motion sensor cameras, the good ones the wildlife photographers use. The plan is simple, brutal. I lure a creature out, drug it, trap it. Then what? That part's still hazy. I want answers. Want to know what makes it tick, how it thinks. Maybe in the back of my mind there's a flicker of hope that science can explain it, that there's a label somewhere in the dark corners of biology that justifies, not the fear, but the fascination that it can be categorized, dissected, and controlled. I doubt it, though. But first, I need to catch it. 
Got a couple of buddies, ex-military. Convince them it's a once-in-a-lifetime hunting trip. They owe me favors, think I'm a bit unhinged since I left my steady job, but they'll be there for backup with their fancy rifles. Me, I'll be there with my grandpa's shotgun, the shells loaded with hand-forged silver buckshot, because even in the age of DNA analysis, sometimes the old stories hold a grain of truth. Maybe I'll get my answers. Maybe I'll just make the woods a little bit safer. And maybe, if I'm being brutally honest with myself, maybe I'll find something out there that puts me back in balance with the world. That finally takes away those twisting shadows in the corners of my vision and the glowing eyes watching from the dark. This happened to me on June 19, 1987, out in the remote woods of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. Lived in a cabin my grandpa built years back. I was a carpenter by trade, but sometimes I'd drop off the grid to clear my head. My name's Wyatt, that's all you need to know. The first sign something wasn't right was the bird song stopping, all at once. That kind of silence hits you in the gut. Up here, you get used to the constant sounds of nature. When those go quiet, it means pay attention. A few nights later, I was chopping firewood when I heard it, a rustling from the thick underbrush near the creek. Figured it was a deer, but when I looked over, I saw something massive moving through the trees, too big for any animal around here. My old dog, Bear, started growling low in his throat. I went back in and checked my rifle was loaded. Bear was a big German shepherd, brave as they come, but he stuck close to me that night. I hardly slept, hearing scratching outside, heavy footsteps on the porch. It left before dawn, leaving me with a sinking feeling in my stomach. The next day, I started setting up traps the heavy-duty kind meant for wild boar. Took me hours, working methodically to calm my nerves. Around dusk, I decided to investigate the creek, bear at my side. Found what I was half expecting, a bloodbath. Ripped apart deer carcass, and not in any way a natural predator would have done it. Tracks, too, bigger than any bear I'd ever seen, and the shapen. Then I saw it, just a glimpse, moving up the hill into the trees. Tall, at least eight feet, built like a beast. I swear I saw a flash of human-like intelligence in its eyes before it vanished. Knew right then I wasn't safe. Bear whined, sensing my fear. I grabbed my stuff, boarded up the cabin as best I could, and hightailed it to the nearest town, figuring even a crummy motel was better than staying out there. I reported it to the local sheriff, a guy named Hank. He listened, took some notes, but I saw the flicker of disbelief in his eyes. Told him he was welcome to come see the carcass for himself. He did, along with a couple of his buddies. Came back looking grim. Said he'd never seen anything like it. Still didn't believe me about what I saw, but at least he put out a warning to hunters and hikers in the area. That was two days ago. I'm still holed up in town, watching my back every second. Slept on Hank's couch last night. He's a good guy. Even offered me an old shotgun his grandpa used back in the day, loaded with some heavy buckshot. Tonight I saw that damn thing again right here, prowling outside my window. It knows I'm here. We both do. First light, I'm hitting the road, gonna try putting some states between me and those woods. Hank suggested heading south, said a friend of his retired down in Arizona, maybe I could lay low there for a while. I ain't got a better plan. Just before I left, I told Hank my theory. Crazy, I know but hear me out. See, 
There are old stories around here, native legends about creatures in the forest, things that ain't quite animal. I always figured they were just tales to scare kids. Now, I don't know. Hank, he didn't laugh. Just gave me a long, hard look and told me to be careful. Thing is, deep down, I felt a sliver of sick excitement when he said that. Part of me is a hunter, a tracker. Part of me wants to face this damn thing, see what it truly is. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe it's the adrenaline talking, but there's a voice in the back of my head that's telling me this ain't over. I stuffed my gear into my truck bare curled up in the passenger seat. As I pulled out of town, I swear I saw a massive shadow slip back into the trees. Hank was right. I gotta be careful. But maybe being careful isn't enough. Maybe sometimes you gotta strap on a pair, grab that shotgun, and go hunting for the monster right back. The drive south was a blur. Every rustle of leaves, every flicker of movement in the rearview mirror sent my pulse racing. Bear, bless his loyal heart, would whimper and press close to me, like he could sense the tension coiling in my gut. Days turned into nights on endless, empty highways. Sleep came in snatches at cheap motels, where I'd barricade the door and doze with the shotgun in my arms. The nightmares were as relentless as the fear, the creature's hulking form, those glowing eyes, the blood-stained muzzle tearing into... No. I couldn't go there. Focus on the road. Focus on survival. I found Hank's friend in a dusty desert town in Arizona. Jeb was his name, a weathered old rancher with eyes that missed nothing. He offered me a spare room and a job mending fences without asking too many questions. It was the closest thing to sanctuary I'd felt in weeks. And for a while... Well, almost felt like normalcy. The hard work exhausted me in a good way, filled my nights with the deep sleep I'd forgotten. Bear loved exploring the wide open spaces, his energy returning with a vengeance. Even the nightmares began to fade. Then came the cattle mutilations. Jeb found one of his heifers, mangled and half-eaten, with those same damn monstrous tracks leading off into the hills. A coldness washed over me, a sense of horrible inevitability. That night, Jeb and I sat on his porch, shotguns loaded, a bottle of whiskey passed between us. We both knew it, even without speaking. The creature had followed me. Them legends, Jeb finally said, his voice low. The old folk in these parts, they got stories too. Skinwalkers, they call em. Things that ain't natural can change shape, hunt men. My stomach clenched. Skinwalkers. The word fit in its own twisted way. Jeb looked at me, his old eyes reflecting the dim porch light. We wait for it. It wasn't a question. It was a warrior's statement. The rest of that night was spent in a tense, silent vigil. Every creak of wood, every rustle of the wind had us jerking to full alert, but the creature didn't come. The sun rose, casting long shadows across the desert, and with it came a strange sense of uneasy peace. Weeks passed. Jeb's ranch was left alone, and I started to believe the worst might be over. Then a local kid went missing. His dirt bike was found crashed in the hills, along with blood and those tracks. The whole town knew without having to be told. The hunt was back on. I joined the search party, armed to the teeth and driven by a mix of dread and grim determination. We scoured the desert, finding nothing but lingering traces of violence. It was like the creature was toying with us, staying just out of reach. One night, I slipped away from the group. Had a hunch, a desperate gamble born of too many sleepless nights. I hiked deep into the hills, alone. Bear refused to go, whimpering at my feet, and for once I understood. 
Whatever lay ahead, it was mine to face. The moon was high when I found the cave. Tucked into a shadowed crevice, its entrance was wide and dark, littered with bones. The rank smell wafting out was enough to make me gag. This was its lair. I crept further in, shotgun raised, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the gloom. The cave twisted and narrowed, the walls covered in scratches. Then it opened into a wide chamber, and there it was. The creature was hunched over something in the center of the space. As I got closer, the beam of my flashlight illuminated the scene with horrible clarity. The missing kid, torn and broken. Rage surged through me, hot and blinding. I roared, a primal bellow, and fired the shotgun. The sound echoed deafeningly in the cave, and the creature jerked upright, a snarl ripping from its throat. Buckshot tore into its shoulder, but it didn't fall. It lunged, a blur of muscle and fury, and my world exploded into pain. I staggered back, barely bringing the gun up in time for another blast. This one hit it square in the chest, staggering it momentarily. But it wasn't enough. There was a blinding flash as pain ripped through my side. I screamed as its massive claws raked across my ribs, throwing me to the ground. The shotgun flew from my grasp. I thrashed, desperate, catching glimpses of teeth, gleaming yellow eyes, the mat at first smeared with fresh blood. Then, a blur of brown fur and teeth. Bear! He'd followed, launching himself at the beast, giving me a precious second to scramble back. The cave filled with snarls and yelps, the sounds of a fight to the death. I staggered to my feet, my vision blurring. The flashlight lay on the ground, shining feebly towards the fray. Bear was holding his own, but the creature was too powerful. I groped for something, anything to use as a weapon. My hand closed around a jagged rock. I roared again pouring every ounce of fury and desperation into the charge. The beast, distracted by Bear, turned too late. I slammed the rock into its skull, once, twice, and then, nothing. I collapsed against the cave wall, my breath ragged sobs. The world spun dizzily. Bear lay near the creature, whimpering softly. Blood soaked his fur, but his eyes were still bright. He'd saved my life. We stumbled out of the cave, into the dawn. I managed to get us both back down the mountainside, my own wounds a fiery agony with each step. I don't remember much after that, except driving on autopilot, bear curled protectively in my lap. Jeb patched me up, asked no questions. The rest, it's a blur. There was a hushed-up investigation— the cave scrubbed clean, the creature's body mysteriously vanishing. The locals whispered about wild animal attacks, about me being a hero for saving that kid. They never found his body. None of it felt real. Jeb offered to let me stay on for good. Said some wounds don't ever fully heal, and the open spaces might offer a reprieve. And he's right, in a way. I'm still here. Still mending fences, still keeping bear close. But the nights, those are the worst. That's when I see the yellow eyes in the darkness, when the weight of that impossible creature settles on my chest, when the nightmares drag me back to that cave. They say some scars run too deep to ever truly go away. Maybe they're right. This happened to me on October 3, 2010, on the outskirts of Pine Grove, Arkansas. Small, sleepy town nestled deep in the heart of Ozark country. I've been a cop here for as long as I can remember. Name's Everett Nash. Married to my high school sweetheart. Got a couple of kids, a dog, the whole white picket fence thing. 
It's a life I never thought I'd leave, but now, now I ain't so sure. It started with whispers. Some livestock found mutilated on the old Kellerman property. Folks blamed it on coyotes, or wild dogs gone rabid, but I had a bad feeling about it. Something was off. I drove out to Kellerman's place, mostly just to put my own mind at ease. That's when I found the cave. Tucked away in a forgotten corner of the sprawling property, half swallowed up by dense forest. It was hardly visible, just a crack in the moss-covered hillside. Something about it, though. It sent a shiver down my spine. Now, I'm usually a skeptical guy. Don't believe in ghosts or Bigfoot, that kind of thing. But with that cave, there was an unease. A prickling at the back of my neck that told me there was something wrong. That night, dispatch got a call. A panicked man screaming, something about his wife, his kids out by the cave. I was closest, so I hauled over there, siren blaring. I found the guy, Mr. Watkins, kneeling in the dirt, sobbing. Blood splattered all over him. His wife lay nearby, my stomach turned, but I forced myself to get closer. It wasn't an animal attack. She'd been torn apart, ripped open. Her kids gone. Watkins kept babbling. Something about a creature, a monster coming out of the cave. I didn't believe him, not then. Not fully. Shock, I figured. Trauma twisting his mind. But there was fear in his eyes, a desperate plea for someone to understand. I radioed for backup, more for Watkins' sake than anything. He needed a hospital. Then, a sound echoed from the darkness— a guttural growl. My blood ran cold. I drew my gun, flashlight beam cutting through the night. There, in the trembling circle of light, something huge lunged at me. A flash of teeth, claws gleaming like knives, and then pain, white hot, as it raked its claws across my chest. I let off a shot, more of a reflexive jerk than any kind of aim. The thing roared and, just as suddenly, it was gone, vanished back into the mouth of that damned cave. By the time backup arrived, it was all over. Watkins calmed enough to tell his story, me bleeding into a makeshift bandage. They didn't fully believe us, of course, muttered about shock and hallucinations, but they couldn't explain the wounds I had, the inhuman size of the tracks around the clearing. The official report went down as Animal attack, suspect unknown Watkins was committed to the state mental facility Haven't seen him since Me, they put on medical leave Told me to get some rest, see a therapist But rest don't come easy I see those eyes, red and glowing in the dark Feel the phantom burn of its claws on my skin every time I close my eyes Sleep, when it does come, is haunted by the terrified cries of Watkins kids echoing off the cave walls. I went back out to Kellerman's farm. The cave entrance was boarded up, a flimsy barrier against something monstrous. My rational mind still can't fully grasp it, that there's a creature out there, an apex predator the likes of which we haven't seen for centuries. But deeper than reason— an animal instinct has taken hold. Primal and chilling, it tells me the creature is still out there, watching, waiting. Folks whisper that I've changed since that night, harder, more distant. Maybe they're right. My wife worries about me. I see it in her eyes. She wants us to leave Pine Grove, start fresh somewhere new. I think about it sometimes, packing up the family— running far away as possible from this place. But another part of me, the hunter, the protector, that part can't let it go. Kellerman's land is bordered by the national forest, miles of dense woods, caves, too many places to hide, too many places for it to strike again. 
somebody's gotta stop it. I just don't know if that somebody is still me. This happened to me on June 19, 2014. I know folks might not believe a word of it, but I swear on my daughter's life, it's the absolute truth. My name is Sam Tucker. I've been a deputy sheriff in tiny Willow Creek, Montana for over 15 years. It's one of those places so far off the beaten path that you'd probably never find it unless you were deliberately aiming for it. The nearest big town is close to 60 miles away, and between here and there stretches a whole lot of forests and mountains. Now, I'm not a superstitious man, never went much for ghost stories or old legends. But that night out on Highway 16 changed my view on the world forever. I was working the night shift, as usual, mostly just to keep the peace and look out for drunk drivers cutting through our town. I was with my partner, Martin, another Willow Creek local. Marty's a good guy, solid and dependable, even if he does have a tendency to ramble. Keeps me entertained during those long, quiet hours patrolling dirt roads. We were finishing a cup of coffee at the station around 2 a.m. when the radio crackled. A caller reported a disturbance and possible gunshots at the old Grayson place up on the mountainside. We figured it was likely some rowdy teenagers, but duty called. We grabbed our gear, hopped into the patrol car, and headed out toward the old abandoned farmhouse. The Grayson place has a dark reputation in Willow Creek. Some locals swore it was haunted. The old man Grayson had snapped back in the 1970s, went crazy, and slaughtered his whole family before disappearing into the wilderness. Nobody ever found his body, and the place had been left to rot ever since. The stories got even wilder during my time at the high school rumors of weird lights in the woods, of strange howls, and of hikers or hunters who ventured up near the place and were never seen again. Marty and I drove the winding, unpaved road up the mountain. We'd had our share of false alarms at the Grayson Place over the years. It usually amounted to nothing more than dumb kids using the place as a party spot or some homeless person looking for a dry place to stay the night. But as we got closer, a chill ran down my spine that couldn't be explained by the brisk mountain air. I reached over and tightened my grip on the shotgun resting beside me. We pulled up to the clearing at the end of the road. The dilapidated old farmhouse sat there like some kind of grim specter, the moonlight casting long, distorted shadows across the overgrown yard. We could hear the sound of shouting and something thudding against the rotting wooden porch. Marty and I looked at each other. He shrugged that usual easy grin slipping off his face. I swallowed hard, a knot of unease forming in my stomach. Cautiously, we got out of the car, flashlights and guns in hand. We approached the farmhouse, my ears straining against the darkness for any sign of activity. It sounded like an all-out brawl coming from inside the house. As we neared the steps, a sickening stench washed over us, a rotten smell of decay mixed with something foul and metallic. Anyone in the house, come out with your hands up! I shouted, my voice unsteady. But the shouting inside continued unabated. I exchanged a look with Marty and nodded at the front door. He kicked it open. The rusty hinges creaked in the silence, and we stepped inside, flashlights sweeping across the dark, dust-filled room. The sight that met us froze the blood in my veins. The entire living room was smeared with blood, splattered on the walls and pooling on the worn floorboards. In the center of the room, two ragged, shirtless men were locked in a vicious fight. But there was something about those men, something wrong. Their movements were jerky and unnatural, their skin pale and stretched too tightly. 
Their faces were gaunt, feral, and contorted with rage. And then, one of them turned to look right at us, his eyes glowing in the beam of my flashlight. They were pure yellow, like an animal's eyes reflecting in the dark. Marty, what the hell? I started, but he just stood there gaping, his flashlight beam shaking wildly. One of the men lunged toward us with a snarl, and pure instinct took over. I raised the shotgun and fired. The blast echoed through the house, and the creature staggered back, a gaping wound in its chest. But instead of blood, some kind of dark greenish ichor dripped from the hole. It let out an inhuman shriek, and its companion launched itself at Marty. My partner screamed as the creature tackled him to the ground, its teeth sinking into the flesh of his neck. I fired again, the shotgun's roar deafening in the enclosed space. The creature flinched and howled, but it didn't let go of Marty. I rushed forward, swinging the butt of my gun and smashing it against the creature's head. It finally released my partner, but its yellow eyes fixed on me with terrifying focus. In a panic, I backed toward the door, stumbling over something on the floor. I glanced down and saw the body of a young woman lying in a pool of her own blood. Her throat was torn open, her face still locked in an expression of horror. I scrambled to my feet and ran towards the door. Marty was still his body horribly mangled. I could hear the creature pursuing me, its ragged breathing and heavy thudding footsteps closing in. I burst through the door and sprinted for the patrol car, fumbling for the keys. The creature lunged, its claws raking my shoulder, tearing through the fabric. I managed to throw myself into the driver's seat and slam the door. It was a desperate scramble, fingers fumbling, as I searched for the keys while the creature pounded against the car, its guttural growls making the windows rattle. Finally, my hand closed around the cold metal. I jammed the key into the ignition and twisted, praying the engine would turn over. It sputtered and roared to life. I slammed the gear into reverse and stomped on the gas. The patrol car lurched backwards, flinging the clawing snarling creature away from it. Reversing blindly, I spun the wheel wildly and sent the car careening down the narrow mountain road. Branches and leaves whipped past the windows as I raced through the woods. The adrenaline pumping through my veins mixed with a sickening cocktail of terror and guilt. Marty was gone. Those things, whatever they were, they had killed him. Fear kept me going. I wasn't sure where I was heading, but I knew I couldn't go back. That farmhouse and those monstrous creatures had to be left far, far behind. The road was unpaved and treacherous, full of blind curves and treacherous dips. Each lurch and bump of the car sent another jolt of pain through my torn shoulder, a grim reminder of how close I had been to the same gruesome fate as poor Marty. After driving for what felt like a lifetime, the narrow trail finally spilled out onto the main highway. Exhausted but determined, I turned the patrol car toward town. Bursts of static shot out of the police radio mounted on the dashboard, but I ignored it. Somehow, reporting cannibalistic monsters to dispatch didn't seem like it would be a productive use of my time. Minutes blurred into a haze as I pushed the protesting engine as fast as it would go. The first rays of dawn were just starting to paint the eastern sky when I finally arrived at the Willow Creek Sheriff's Office. I stumbled out of the car, a ragged, blood-spattered mess. Thankfully, the early morning shift hadn't arrived yet. The emptiness of the station almost broke me. Marty should have been there cracking jokes and brewing coffee. The weight of his death crashed down on me as I slumped against the patrol car, my knees unable to support me anymore. When the other deputies showed up a few minutes later, their shocked faces told me I looked as crazy as I felt. 
I told them everything about the call, the blood-soaked farmhouse, Marty, the creatures. They stared at me like I'd grown a second head. I tried to find the right words to explain, to make them believe me, but the story sounded insane even to my own ears. Understandably, Sheriff Thompson had me committed to the psych ward at the nearest hospital. Spent two weeks there under observation, poked, prodded, questioned endlessly about the night at the Grayson Place. They called it a traumatic incident, PTSD, some kind of psychotic break. I played along, let them call it whatever they wanted, because I knew the truth. There were things in those woods, things beyond explaining, things that shattered everything I thought I knew about the world. When they finally released me, I resigned my badge. I couldn't bear stepping into the station without seeing Marty's empty chair, without feeling the weight of the secret I couldn't share. Willow Creek became unlivable to me. Every whispered rumor I heard, every sideways glance confirmed that most folks thought I'd gone off the deep end. Life after that became a blur. I moved from one small town to another, taking whatever jobs I could find. Handyman work, night watchman, whatever kept me busy enough to drown out the memories. Sometimes, late at night when the shadows lengthen and the world feels just a little less solid, I see them again, those glowing yellow eyes, that blood-stained room, the shredded remains of my partner. The aftermath of that night wasn't just the death I witnessed, or even my own shattered sanity. It was the weight of knowing. Knowing that darkness lurks in the hidden corners of the world, that the veil of normalcy we all cling to is a hell of a lot thinner than we like to think. Some nights, I think back to the young woman I saw dead on the floor of that farmhouse, and a bitter resolve fills me. Maybe there's purpose in my survival. Maybe I'm meant to learn more about those creatures to find a way to stop them, to make sure that what happened to Marty, to all the others who likely vanished up in those woods, doesn't happen again. But mostly, I just try to keep moving. I avoid the deep woods and the lonely places. I try to build a simple life, a quiet one. Because even if nobody else ever believes me, I know what I saw. And I know that out there, Somewhere in the dark between the trees, those yellow eyes are still watching. Hunting. November 8, 2005. Found the perfect spot out in the main woods. Figured it'd make a good winter camp. I'm Wes. Spent most of my adult life off-grid. Bit of a drifter. Never stuck around any place too long. City life never agreed with me. Too much noise. Too many people. Out here, it's just me and the trees. Set up a decent cabin. Solid. Kept the weather out. Did some hunting. Filled my wood pile. All the usual prepping for when the snow really moved in. Then the locals started disappearing. One old-timer, Jeb, went out to check his trap lines and never came back. A week later, a couple hikers vanished off a popular trail. Search and rescue went in, but all they found was some trashed campsites. Folks started whispering about bear attacks gone bad, but I knew better. I'd seen enough predators to know this wasn't their style. It was around then I first spotted movement near my cabin. Never caught a good look, just flashes of something big and dark between the trees. I got that crawling feeling, like I was being watched. Heard noises at night too, snapped branches, something heavy circling my camp. Started sleeping with my shotgun by the bed. A few nights later, I woke to a sound like the whole damn forest was screaming. It was coming from the west, towards where Jeb and those hikers had gone missing. Grabbed my shotgun, stepped outside. The air hung heavy, smelling of wet fur and something sour underneath. 
I found Jeb's body half a mile from my cabin. What was left of him, anyway? It looked like something huge had ripped him apart, then dragged what remained through the brush. I dropped to my knees, puked right there in the snow. That's when I saw it, standing near the tree lean, watching. I only caught its silhouette against the moon, but that was enough. Tall, hunched, but moving on two legs. Its arms were too long, its head too big and pointed, like a wolf that got stretched wrong. I fired a shot, more to scare the thing off than anything. It roared, a sound that raised the hair on my neck, and bolted into the trees. I stumbled back to my cabin, bolted the door, and waited for dawn. First light, I packed my gear and got the hell out of there. Didn't stop until I hit the nearest highway, flagged down a passing truck. Told the driver some story about a botched hunting trip, needed to get back to civilization. He gave me a long look but didn't ask questions. When I finally made it to a town, saw the news reports about Jeb and the hikers. They called it animal attacks, but I knew what was out there. That night, I lay in a cheap motel room, listening to the traffic rumble by, and swore I could still smell that creature on the wind. Maine was burned for me. I drifted south, started bouncing between odd jobs, construction, ranch hand work, stuff that kept me moving. Never went into deep woods again. I sleep with a loaded pistol under my pillow now, even in towns. See its shape in every shadow, hear its snarl in the back of my mind. City lights don't feel so crowded anymore, now that I know what darkness really hides. Folks around here, they've probably got their own names for it. Maybe some stories passed down from old-timers who saw it before, glimpsed it lurking on the edge of the campfire light. The locals in Maine, they called it the rake. October 23, 1993 I always liked figuring out how things worked, so when my truck broke down halfway between nowhere and gone, the first thing I did was laugh. Guess living in a cabin out in the Alaskan wilderness meant getting used to fixing my own problems. My name's Silas. Ex-mechanic, looking for some quiet after too many years spent under greasy hoods. Popped the hood, started poking around. Engine wasn't making the usual bad noises, which meant an electrical glitch somewhere. While tracing wires, I heard a crash like something big moving through the trees. Figured it was a moose, not uncommon around these parts. Kept my head down, figuring it would wander off. Then I smelled it, a sharp metallic tang, mixed with something rotten, like a gut pile left out too long. The hairs on my neck stood up. Whatever it was, it wasn't a moose. I eased slowly away from the truck, keeping an eye on the tree lean. That's when I saw it. Hunched between two pines, easily eight feet tall. Covered in coarse, dark fur with a matted mane running down its back. Its long arms seemed to drag on the ground as it moved, and its head sat low on its shoulders, snout too long and pointed. But it was the eyes that got me, yellow and slitted, gleaming with a cold intelligence. I stumbled backwards, tripping over a root. The creature let out a snarl like metal scraping metal, and lunged. I scrambled to my feet, booked it towards the cabin, heart pounding so loud I was afraid the thing would hear it over my ragged breaths. I could hear it crashing through the undergrowth behind me, its snarls getting closer. My cabin wasn't much, one room, a wood stove, some basic supplies, but the door was solid. Slammed it shut, through the deadbolt, and collapsed, gasping for air. Outside, I heard the creature slamming against the walls, the hinges groaning ominously. It circled the cabin for hours, 
the rasping of its claws against the wood a constant, grating torment. As the sun began to set, the noises finally subsided. I didn't risk moving until full daylight. Opening the door, I saw the damage, walls scored deep, the window by the woodpile cracked. And in the muddy ground, footprints, not human, not bare, but clawed and heavy, too long for anything I recognized. I took a steadying breath and went to work. Boarded up the broken window, reinforced the hinges on the door. I left the deadbolt off. If the thing came back, I didn't want it trapped inside with me. That afternoon, I hiked out to my emergency supply cache, stashed a few miles away. Grabbed spare ammo, my old military-issue survival kit, and shouldered the heavy pack. The truck sat where I left it, the hood still up. I did a quick repair on the busted ignition wires, good enough to get it rolling, packed the essentials, and got the hell out of there. Stopped at the nearest town with a general store. Told the owner I'd been chased off by a brown bear, needed some ammo for my rifle. He eyed me suspiciously, but sold me the shells. Locals around here are used to keeping to themselves. Maybe they've seen things too, things they don't put a name to. Never went back to that cabin. Even now, truck engines don't rattle me the way the sound of claws on wood does. Sometimes out on the road, when the shadows stretch long across the asphalt, I catch a whiff of that rotten meat smell and a shiver runs down my spine. I look in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see a hulking shape, eyes gleaming in the twilight. I got a small trailer now, the kind you can tow behind a truck. Keep it packed and hitched up. I still take mechanic jobs for folks in remote towns, but I never stay too long. They call me a drifter, and I suppose they're right. But sleeping behind a different steering wheel every night feels a whole lot safer. Folks up here, some of the old-timers, they whisper stories of the Adlet, a creature from Inuit legends, a monstrous mix of man and wolf. Maybe that's what I saw. Maybe it has other names, in other places, other shadowed corners of the map. All I know is, out there in the wild lonesome places, there are things older than our names for them, with a hunger that doesn't care what we call them back. This happened to me on June 19, 1999. I still remember it clearly. I was a small-town deputy in Lincoln County, Nevada a place of rolling desert, the occasional cluster of Joshua trees, and long, lonely stretches of highway. My name is Deputy Russell Yates, been behind the badge for about seven years now. It's a quiet corner of the world, for the most part. You've got your petty theft, your drunk and disorderly, the occasional domestic dispute, nothing out of the ordinary for a place like this. See, out here, folks tend to be the quiet type or the ones who came out here specifically to be left well enough alone. We get a few tourists passing through from time to time, mostly on their way to Vegas, but by and large, we live and let live. Now, I wouldn't call myself superstitious. But there are stories. You sit around the campfire long enough out here, you hear things. Whispers about critters that ain't quite right in the high desert, things folks saw flittering along ridgelines in the moonlight. We always laughed it off, tall tales born of boredom and too much cheap whiskey. This particular day started like any other. I pulled a double shift due to Johnson calling in sick with a mighty bad hangover. Patrol out on Highway 375 the one the UFO nuts call the extraterrestrial highway, never understood it myself. Mostly, it was just hauling over truckers running late on their deliveries. Afternoon rolled in, and the sun was beating down something fierce. 
I decided to pull in at one of the dusty outposts, Mildred's Diner, for iced tea. You see, Mildred made the best darn tea in the entire county, bar none. Place was deserted save for Mildred herself behind the counter, wiping down the formica with a damp rag. Looking a bit tuckered out, Russell, she said, her voice as dry as the sagebrush. I sighed and pulled up a stool. Long night and the kind of heat that makes a man dream of rain. Something more than that, she said, fixing me with a steady stare. Something's got you spooked. Now, I wouldn't say Mildred was psychic or anything, but she had a knack for reading folks. Maybe it was all those years listening to trucker gossip. I hesitated, then shrugged. It wasn't much, but it had been gnawing at me. Just a call that came in this morning. Old Mrs. Peterson out near the foothills? Said she found her dog. Well, what was left of it, anyway? Torn apart all strange. Mildred shook her head. Coyotes again? Maybe. Could be mountain lions getting bold. But the way she described it. I trailed off, not wanting to sound foolish even in the dim, deserted diner. Mildred just refilled my tea glass and tapped the rim. Sometimes the things we don't say are louder than any tall tale, Russell. I left the diner feeling oddly unsettled. Highway 375 stretched out before me, shimmering and empty. It was getting on towards dusk, the desert painted in tones of purple and gold. Usually, this was my favorite time of day, the world cooling off, but a prickle of unease crawled down my spine. Mile markers ticked past. I scanned the horizon the way you do, out of habit more than expectation. It was then I saw it, just a flicker in the dimming light. At first, I thought it was a deer, a trick of the eye. But as I got closer, something seemed off. Too tall for a deer, hunched over, moving with a strange, jerky gait. I slowed the cruiser down to a crawl, keeping the headlights off. There was enough twilight to see the figure in stark silhouette. It was standing stock still by the side of the road, its head turned towards me. Humanoid, yet not, tall and spindly, with limbs that seemed just a touch too long. My mouth went dry. I reached for the radio, hand trembling, and barked out my location. Backup was a good thirty minutes out, at least. The figure tilted its head, and I swear, even in the twilight, I could make out its eyes, wide and luminous, reflecting back my headlights as I flipped them on in a burst of panic. And then it moved. Not like any animal I'd ever seen, not with that speed and fluidity. It closed the distance between us in a matter of seconds, scrambling up onto the hood of my cruiser, claws raking across the windshield. I cried out and slammed the vehicle in reverse, heart pounding like a rabbit's under a hawk's eye. The creature, whatever the hell it was, clung with unnatural strength, its long, bony fingers clawing for purchase. I caught a glimpse of its face, all sharp angles and impossibly wide eyes that burned like embers in the darkness. The radio crackled with the dispatcher's voice, but it was distant, drowned out by the pounding of my own terrified heart and the screeching of tearing metal. One misshapen hand smashed through the windshield, the creature lunging for me. I fumbled for my gun, firing wildly. The shots echoed across the silent desert, but the thing seemed impervious. It shrieked, a piercing, inhuman sound that sent chills down my spine. I slammed the cruiser into drive, the screech of tires tearing through the still desert air. The creature was thrown, its body tumbling along the asphalt, but it scrambled back to its feet with unnatural speed, its eyes fixed on me as I sped away. I radioed for backup again, my voice hoarse with terror, describing the impossible creature I'd encountered. 
They sounded skeptical, of course. It probably came out as the panicked ramblings of an overworked deputy. But I knew what I saw. Still see it, I think, in the quiet of the night when the desert wind whispers through the Joshua trees. I didn't drive home that night. I drove to the nearest town and holed up in a cheap motel room, staring numbly at the flickering TV. My patrol car was found abandoned by the side of Highway 375, windshield shattered, the seat soaked with my own cold sweat. They chalked it up to sleep deprivation, maybe a coyote with mange and a hell of an attitude. Mildred fixed me a strong pot of coffee when I finally stumbled back into her diner, looking more haunted than any ghost story spook tourist. She didn't say a word, just slid the coffee across the counter, her eyes dark and understanding. The other deputies gave me wide berth for a while. I became one of those stories, the guy who went a little loco out in the desert. I never told them the full truth couldn't risk being dismissed as a complete crackpot. I still patrol these desert roads, a little more watchful, a little less sure of what else might be lurking out in those wide-open spaces. And sometimes, on long, quiet nights, I think I catch a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye, a flash of those burning, in human eyes. A shadow falls over my life now, a sliver of unease that never fully fades. Some nights, the image of that impossible creature flashes before my eyes as I try to sleep, the memory of its raking claws and burning stare a nightmare I cannot escape. The town whispers, of course. They say I saw a skinwalker, some desert demon of native legend. Others claim it's all some government conspiracy a test gone wrong out at Area 51. The truth, I fear, is stranger, wilder than any explanation we dare to utter. I try to carry on, try to live a semblance of a normal life. I still answer calls, still pull over speeding motorists, still drink Mildred's sweet tea and eat her greasy, heart-stopping diner breakfasts. But there's a distance now, a distance between myself and the easy familiarity of this small-town life. I see the world through a different lens, tainted by the realization that shadows hold more than just the absence of light. Then, a month later, another call comes in. It's a missing persons report. A pair of hikers, young college kids on some ill-advised adventure off the beaten track. Their gear was found, campsite abandoned, just a few miles from where my encounter took place. The knot of dread in my stomach tightens. I know, somewhere deep down, that those kids aren't coming back. But the responsibility weighs on me as heavy as the desert sun, as unforgiving as the rocky scrubland. The search party assembles deputies, volunteers, guys with rescue dogs that have eyes filled with a heartbreaking hope. I volunteer to lead a team into the foothills, a grim determination in my veins. We find what's left of them two days later. It's a scene straight out of a horror movie, one that would have scoffed at on the silver screen as too gruesome, too unrealistic. Yet here it is, under the indifferent blue sky, the truth that lies beyond campfire tales and conspiracy theories. I don't tell them about the creature. It's pointless. They would write it off as stress, trauma, whatever they need to in order to keep their own perception of the world intact. I simply describe tracks, strange, elongated animal tracks, deeper than any coyote or mountain lion would leave. They nod solemnly, make the official notes, and pack up the tattered remains of those kids with practiced, efficient hands. Later, back at the station, I sit at my desk, staring out the window. Johnson comes in, slaps my shoulder with exaggerated heartiness. Hey, Russ, heard you found our adventurous idiots. Hell of a mess out there, huh? He doesn't wait for a reply, just moves on to gossip about who's sleeping with who down at the saloon. I turn back to the window, 
a hollow ache in my chest. The desert stretches out beyond the town, vast and implacable. I know those kids aren't the last. The creature, whatever it is, is hungry, and we are the feast laid out under the stars. There's a terror in that knowledge, a gnawing helplessness in the face of an unknown, unpredictable predator. But there's also a hard kernel of resolve solidifying in my gut. The next day, I hand in my resignation. Mildred raises an eyebrow when I stop in for one last cup of coffee but says nothing. I think she understands. Word gets around fast in a small town. Folks avoid my eyes, whisper when I pass. Coward, some call me. Deserter. Maybe they're right. But I can't stay here, can't pretend that things can ever go back to the way they were. What I saw out there shattered that illusion with the brutal force of claws against steel. I pack what little I own into my beat-up old truck, an aimless destination in mind. There's a rumor I heard a while back, whispered among the truckers passing through, of another patch of desert where strange things walk under the moonlight. A place in Texas, near the border, where the land is scarred with arroyos and the shadows hold the whisper of old, dark secrets. It's a flimsy lead, a fool's errand, probably. But it's all I have. I'm not the hero type, never was. Yet I also know I can't turn my back on this, this thing that stalks the edge of the world. There's a hunt in my blood now, a drive born of fear and anger and a desperate need to understand the shape of the nightmare that invaded my quiet life. As I pull out of town, the last image of Lincoln County fades in my rearview mirror, Mildred's Diner, its neon sign buzzing, a lone beacon against the encroaching desert dusk. I drive west, the setting sun blazing a path before me. The radio crackles with static, and up ahead, the road stretches on, empty and endless. The aftermath is yet to be written. Maybe I'll find something out there, some other soul who's seen behind the curtain and survived. Or maybe I'll become just another story whispered around a campfire, a cautionary tale about the things you don't want to find, even as you search. But one thing is certain I'm not Russell Yates, small-town deputy, anymore. I'm something else now, something forged in the crucible of that moonlit encounter. I'm a hunter walking the line between the known and the unknown, and I won't stop until I find answers, or until the shadows claim me for good. I had taken the job as a fire lookout in the sprawling forests of the Chippewa National Forest, a remote ribbon of wilderness in Minnesota. The isolation suited me. I was looking to escape the cling of past mistakes and a failed marriage. My name is Mercer, and solitude was my chosen sanctuary. From my tower, perched high above the tree line, I watched for plumes of smoke that might signal a blaze. My only company was a radio crackling with the occasional check-ins from my distant supervisor, Remy. It started subtly. Overlooked oddities in an otherwise regimented routine, missing supplies from the cabin, strange marks on the trees around the base of my tower not quite animal, not quite human. Then came the discovery that severed any semblance of normalcy. Two hikers, one early morning, appeared beneath my tower in a panic. Their friend had gone missing during the night. They described sounds in the darkness, unsettling screeches that made their hair stand on ends. Their worry infected me, and with palpable reluctance, I descended to assist in what I presumed was an ill-prepared hiker's more than likely unfortunate encounter with local wildlife. We combed the forest with methodical precision learned from mandatory search and rescue training. That's when we found what no training could prepare me for, not their friend but rather what remained. 
Tucked against the fallen log was an unnaturally twisted silhouette, marked more by absence than presence. Flesh flayed in patterns that suggested neither hunger nor defense but something akin to grotesque artistry. The hiker's reaction was raw and unfiltered dread. Names like Vega and Darnell weren't meant to be attached to faces twisted by such terror. I urged them back to safety with assurances laced heavily with doubts I felt bitterly sung through my gut. The nights became harrowing ordeals. Every shadow at my window seemed to move with deliberate intent. The silhouette I'd seen by day haunted me, painting every innocent rustle with malevolent purpose. Days morphed into an exercise of hypervigilance as rumors spread through radio check-ins about other disappearances. Details scarce, but outcomes shared a chilling sameness. Mutilation disguised as some deranged interpretation of craft. Conversations with Remy grew strained as my tension bled through each static written exchange. Jokes about needing thicker socks to ward off the cold did little to thaw the chill that had settled deep into my bones. Finally, it seemed, the forest itself began closing in, a conspiracy of flora and fauna against human intrusion. Alone became not just situation but also sensation, a word that scratched at the inside of my skull. One crisp dawn, I stepped out upon a discovery that shredded any hope remaining, my ladder removed and repurposed into a gnarled construction. It looked almost ritualistic, the same precision marring its arrangement as those unspeakable acts upon human forms. The following morning brought quiet. I expected screams, maybe another mangled body, but there was nothing. The silence drove me to action. I needed to leave, find people, or at least a place where a signal could break through the dense canopy. I left a note for Remy. It was brief, outlined my plan to hike out and get help. Cell service was non-existent here, and returning to base without knowing what waited felt like signing my own death warrant. The day passed in a blur of movement. Hours turned into miles, the curtain of trees my constant companion. Night fell before I could reach the outskirt of the forest where roads and civilization marked their boundaries. I set up a tent with hands that refused to steady themselves. Sleep stayed elusive as every creak and whisper of the forest morphed into threats in my mind. It attacked in the early hours before dawn could ease night's grip on the world. Scratching against my tent was the first hint. I froze, breath jammed in my throat as silence returned for one treacherous second. Then it tore through canvas-like paper. Claws, not of any creature known to these woods, gleamed in the scant light that filtered through the trees. It was massive, towering over me where I lay coiled in dread. I scrambled from the tent as it swiped again claws catching on fabric instead of flesh by pure chance. There was nothing human about its form disproportionate limbs contorted as it moved with incredible speed for its size. Through terror-driven agility, I fled into the trees, the creature in close pursuit. Every step seemed labored, its breaths came as guttural exhalations that fogged in the cold air. In my flight, I stumbled upon a park ranger's cabin, door ajar. Inside was chaos, signs of a struggle visible even in fleeting glances as I slammed and barred the entry behind me. It threw itself against the door repeatedly, each slam punctuated by roars that held no language, only violence. Hours stretched endlessly until it ceased all at once retreating with the same abruptness it employed to shatter that fragile sense of safety night granted me. When sunlight finally dared touch the forest floor, breaking through heavy branches overhead, I ventured out from my refuge. Others needed to know what lurked among these trees, a creature unlike any wildlife documented before. Evidence littered around me, down branches bearing deep gouges, ground torn apart where it chased me, spoke clearer than words ever could. 
It took two days to find others. A search party scouting for missing persons including those from our group. Vega and Darnell now confirmed dead by nameless aggression they couldn't have fathomed or escaped from either. As harrowing tales spilled from my lips, met with furrowed brows and disbelief masquerading as concern among officials who collected them for records that would likely dismiss truth for convenience's sake. Returning was not an option. The wilderness claimed enough victims already, but leaving offered no solace. Those imprints etched upon their lifeless faces bore into memory with permanence harsher than any physical scar inflicted by claws unseen yet indubitably real. 